Welcome to Dr. Creepin's Dungeon. Well, it is said that there's no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. But what if what it cares about is something downright evil? Question posed by tonight's two stories. Now, as ever, before we begin, a word of caution. Tonight's stories may contain strong language, as well as descriptions of violence and horrific imagery. If that sounds like your kind of thing, then let's begin with... My homeowners association seems to be a little too passionate about enforcing its rules. Oh, it was the perfect house. Built in the craftsman style, it was a beautiful amalgamation of wood, stone and brick. Its solid walls were adorned with broad windows that welcomed the early morning sunlight. It had a pillared porch made of old and stained wood that stood overlooking a lawn so well maintained it resembled a green carpet. A gravel driveway led up to a garage that was set up next to the house. The rooms were spacious, waiting to be filled with dreams and memories. It seemed like the ideal place to raise a family in. If only we had better neighbours. We had our first encounter with the Homeowners Association on the very day we moved in. The sun beamed fire down upon us as we moved our boxes from the truck I'd rented into the house. My wife and daughter were inside, sorting through the boxes, deciding which ones to open first, while I was out on the driveway, taking a short break from the tiring work to admire the gigantic oak tree that stood in the corner of the property, with one of its thick branches sneaking up to a window upstairs. I didn't even notice when she snuck up on me. Oh, it's a beautiful house, isn't it? I jumped, startled. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I turned around and squinted, putting my hand up to my forehead to protect my eyes from the fiery sun. It was a woman, early to mid-forties, short blonde hair in a wavy bob cut. She was dressed professionally in a pencil skirt suit and had a leather binder in her hand. With a smile... She extended her hand. I shook it. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm the president of the Homeowners Association here. Well, hello, Amanda. I greeted her. I'm Irfan. Irfan Abbas. I guess we're your newest neighbors. Her smile grew broader. It seems to be that way. Although I'm not your immediate neighbor, I live three houses down the street. She chuckled. Oh, glad to have you in our community, Irfan. Hope you and your family come to love this place as much as we do. I sure hope so, I replied. Never thought we'd make it to a gated community. Oh, it's absolutely perfect, she gushed. There's a great school just within walking distance. The HOA maintains its own childcare center, and we even have a common swimming pool and a tennis court just around the corner. I read about it when I signed the documents for the house. I admit it. It truly does sound like a dream. <laughs> like I said, it's perfect, she giggled. I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, I flashed her a warm smile. But probably the best thing about living here are the people, she added. We truly have a sense of community here, you know. We all look out for each other. If anyone needs anything, the rest of us are always willing to help. I hesitated. Yeah? She frowned. Oh, is everything okay? Yeah, no, no, I said hastily. Everything's fine. I didn't want to tell her about our next-door neighbor, who didn't really seem at all happy to see us. He sat in his cane chair, next to the big flag proudly fluttering from a pole mounted on the deck, with a permanent scowl on his face as we moved our luggage into the house. Oh, you don't mean David, do you? She flushed, slightly embarrassed. Please don't mind him. David's harmless. He's just been a little down ever since he lost his son. He died there, you know, in Afghanistan. She leaned forward and added that last part in a whisper. We're from Iraq, I clarified. Right, right, 
she replied dismissively. As I was saying, he's a lovely person. Just give him a chance. I'm sure he'll come round. I nodded. Sure. So, um, if there's anything else? Well, I really do have a lot of work to get done today. Oh yeah, um, before you go. I looked at her as she fumbled with the clasp of her binder before pulling out a crisp white paper. Here. She handed it to me. This document contains all the rules that the members of the HOA are supposed to follow. Standard stuff about lawn maintenance, house upkeep, and trash collection. Well, my eyes scanned the document. Sure. Oh, please read it carefully. I will. No. Please. Do read it carefully. I looked at her in confusion. Like I said, I will. Well, her hand shot up like a viper and she grabbed my wrist. I winced at the vice-like grip she had on me. The smile was gone from her face, replaced by a disturbing mix of fear and frustrated impatience. I must repeat myself again, Mr. Abbas. It's imperative that you read the rules very carefully. She was breathing heavily and had a manic look on her face. There were other residents who refused to follow the rules, or were just too lazy to keep up. Some of them had to eventually sell their houses and move on, and they were the lucky ones. I freed my hand and clenched my fist repeatedly. Um, are you threatening me right now, Miss Amanda? Her eyes widened. What? No, please try and understand. Everyone in this community has to follow the rules. Me, you, no exceptions. Bad things start to happen to us if we don't. Things that are entirely out of our control. She tilted her head and subtly pointed at David's house. Was she trying to suggest... No, can't be. I'll say it once again. Please take this seriously. There's absolutely nothing strange about the rules themselves, but the consequences of not following them can be painfully out of the norm. Because, like I said, this place is perfect. But that sort of perfection always comes with a cost. Well, I was getting very weirded out by this conversation, so just nodded as seriously as I could. We will take this with all the seriousness that it deserves, I promise. A smile crossed her face again. It was jarring just how quickly she switched expressions. Well, <laughs> welcome to Seastone Ridge, Irfan. I decided not to tell my wife about the strange talk I'd had with the president of the HOA, at least not while our daughter was around. We could talk about nutty Amanda's strange behaviour and superstitions later in the evening when Abida had gone to bed, I reasoned. As I strolled into the house, I saw my wife and daughter sitting on the floor and laughing as they chatted away. Oh, I could feel tears welling up in my eyes as I saw how happy and relaxed they looked. We'd seen so much, been through so much, and to finally be safe and comfortable like this was more than what we could have ever dreamed about. All worries and doubts faded from my mind. I was just relieved we were all together. Baba! Abida exclaimed when she saw me, her hijab almost slipping off her head. I smiled placed the document Amanda had given me on an unopened box, and went and joined my family. We spent the whole day trying to make the house livable. We tackled the bedrooms first, and after Abida chose the room upstairs near the oak tree, I assembled her bed and then moved on to our room down the hall. By the time the sun began to go down, we'd set up the two bedrooms and gone through most of the work in the kitchen area. We ordered pizza for dinner, and after we ate it, we played a game of Uno, before retiring to our bedrooms. There was a lot to be done the next day. Not just the packing, but I had to get in touch with my boss, and we had to look at high schools for Abida. Oh, I was so preoccupied with everything that my encounter with the HOA president in the morning completely slipped my mind, and I didn't tell my wife about it. Oh, I would come to regret that. A lot. I was having a fitful sleep, teetering at the edge of wakefulness when I terrible screech ripped through the silence of the night. I sat up straight, my heart racing as another screech erupted and then another, followed by faint sobbing. I took a deep breath to calm myself down. My wife moved. I put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry, I got this. It's my turn. 
She grunted and mushed her head against the pillow. I yawned and rolled out of the bed, put on my slippers and walked out of the room towards Abidance. I flipped on the light switch and saw my daughter sitting up on bed, her knees drawn close to her chest, shivering and whimpering with a blanket wrapped around her like a cocoon. Hey, I said gently as I glided over and sat at the foot of her bed. It's okay, you're safe. She sobbed harder, tears streaming down her cheeks. It's okay, Abida, I repeated. You're safe. Nothing's going to harm you, okay? Her body got racked with shivers again. Abida, I said. I need you to breathe. Can you do that for me? She nodded. Breathe in. She inhaled. Now hold. One, two, three, four. Now breathe out. We went through her usual exercises. I asked her to breathe deeply, had her dig her toes into the bed, and then asked her to think about the time we'd gone out to eat ice cream in Baghdad, back when her brother was still with us. She began to calm down. I wondered what had triggered the attack this time. Maybe it's the stress of moving into a new home. Well, I didn't have to wonder for long, because she told me soon after I hugged her. And it made my blood run cold. There was someone at the window, Baba. I froze. I swear, I'm not lying, she cried. There really was someone there. I jumped out of the bed and raced to the window. There was nothing out there. Only the leaves of the oak tree gently scraping against the glass. I spotted the branch of the tree. It was thick enough to support the weight of a person. I couldn't see what he looked like. He just looked like a shadow, but I knew he was there. He was tapping against the window and didn't stop until I screamed. Fear crashed into me like a hurricane. Could she be telling the truth? I mean, why would she lie? She has no reason to, and she's never lied about something like this before. My mind leapt back to the conversation I'd had in the morning with Amanda. Could this have something to do with what she was telling me about? No, that's not possible. Baba, you believe me, right? Yes, Abida, I believe you. Of course I do. She gulped, put her trembling hand up and pointed at the door behind me. Because... I think there was someone downstairs as well. I looked at her in stunned silence, half expecting a hand to slither out of the darkness and wrap itself around my neck like a boa constrictor. Beads of sweat trickled down my brow. I heard footsteps, but I wasn't really sure. But then I saw that shadow at the window. Go to your mother, I said fiercely. Lock the door behind you and call 911. I waited until she'd hurried over to her mother, watched as the door shut behind her with a soft click, and then prepared to move downstairs. My thumb hit the switch on the wall to my right, and the staircase was instantly bathed in a dull orange glow. But beyond that, there was utter darkness. From where I was, it looked like a living thing, shifting and swirling, ready to swallow anything that touched its infernal blackness. I took a step down and flinched as the floorboards creaked. I swore under my breath and hoped that the intruder hadn't heard me. I blinked as sweat trickled down my jaw and wondered whether I was doing the right thing. Should I go downstairs and check? What if I get attacked? I shook my head. Well, isn't it my job to protect my family? I bolted down the stairs ignoring the painful creaks and groans, and rushed over to where I thought the light switch was, fumbled around for a couple of extremely tense seconds before feeling relieved when my fingers found it. My index finger, slick with sweat, pushed the switch down. The living room was blasted with light. I scanned my surroundings. The doors were locked. I was alone. Ah, oh, my daughter seemed to have imagined it all. Or at least, that's what I thought until my eyes dropped and I noticed the floor. In the middle of the living room, on the floor, someone had used mud to scrawl the word, Welcome. The writing was sprawling, 
occupying the space of a small coffee table. There were muddy boot prints that went back and forth from the word, probably made by the person who made this little sign. I tracked them, and my heart sank when I saw where they led to. I thought they'd lead to the front or the back door. But no. They led me to the locked door of the basement. Part 2 Well, I'm telling you, Mr. Abbas, there's no one here. I didn't reply, just silently watched as the flashlight dipped and wove across the walls of the basement. The small room was cramped, the clutter of the previous owners stacked in it from floor to ceiling. A faint smell of mould clung to everything like glue, but there was no trace of any intruder there. <laughs> you saw the bootprints, officer. I pointed out. The cop, a Joseph Gorodzki, pulled his hat off and scratched his bald head. Are you absolutely sure that your daughter wasn't the one who drew it at all? I gritted my teeth in frustration. Once again, my daughter is not well, but you can be damn sure she's not crazy. He put his hands up to pacify me. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, but you have to understand. All signs point to it having been done by someone on the inside. Now we've searched the house, top to bottom, found all the doors to be locked, and you've yourself confirmed that that's the way they were before we arrived. I mean, you opened the basement door in front of us, right? I nodded sullenly. Right. He made a show of peeking behind a dust-riddled table. So then it means that this was done by someone on the inside. And as you say, you have a daughter with a history of PTSD, panic attacks, and a whole assortment of mental illnesses. I cut him off. It wasn't... Please, Mr. Abbas, he said, a little firmly this time as he stopped and looked at me. You should be aware that there are consequences to filing false complaints. Please make sure not to call 911 unless there's an actual emergency. Well, I wanted to argue with him, but what could I say? None of this made any sense. How could anyone have gotten in when all the doors and windows big enough for someone to squeeze through were all locked shut? And I definitely knew that it wasn't Abid. If she had done this, consciously or not, I would have known. I still remember how badly the stairs creaked and how loud they sounded in the silence of the night. Look, uh, perhaps you need a therapist more than the police. I didn't respond to that comment and just followed him back upstairs, shooting one last glance at the dark and foreboding-looking basement. A tall cabinet stood in the corner, an ideal place for someone to hide in. Well, if only its doors hadn't been ripped off. I shook my head and stomped upstairs, reminding myself to replace the incandescent bulb hanging by a string from the ceiling so that I wouldn't have to stumble around in the dark the next time I'm there. Back in the living room, I found Officer Gorochki's partner, Officer Schmidt, talking to my wife, who was seated on the only sofa we'd unpacked, protectively hugging our daughter. Are we done here? Joseph Gorochki asked. Yep, his partner replied, flipping his pad shut. Please, Mrs. Abbas, if there's any actual emergency, don't hesitate to call us. She smiled at him, and then shot me an angry look. What was that about? I followed the two cops outside and waited as they got into their car and drove off, lighting up the dark street in quiet flashes of red and blue. The neighborhood looked so calm, so peaceful. I could hear crickets chattering away, oblivious to the danger my family had just been in. Hard to believe that an intruder had come to our house, in a place that looked so deceptively safe. As I walked back in, I noticed Abida wasn't there. She was probably back upstairs, but not my wife. No, she was still sitting exactly where I'd left her, and just lit into me the moment I came in. So, she remarked, anger dripping like molten wax from her voice. When were you going to tell me? Tell you what? I asked, confused. This, she yelled, picking up a sheet of paper and waving it around angrily. I winced and squeezed my eyes shut. It was the document that Amanda had left for me, one that I'd forgotten to tell Rabia about. 
How could you, Irfan? How could you hide something this important from me? Oh, it just slipped my mind. Slipped your mind? She thundered. Something that affects your family's safety just slipped your mind? Wait, how do you know about this? I asked. That list of rules didn't contain anything strange. It was just your average HOA staff. So how does she know about the implications of those rules? The ones Amanda had warned me about. That police officer was nice enough to warn me, she replied. Yeah, he told me everything. He's been patrolling this community for a while now, and knows everything that there is to know about this place. Everything that my husband should have told me. I learned from a stranger. It's just nonsense, I mumbled. Excuse me? I rubbed my eyebrows. You actually believe in all this, do you? Just because we didn't follow some random rules, we're suddenly being stalked by something supernatural. It's ridiculous. She looked at me like I'd grown another head. Yarabia, you saw what happened tonight, didn't you? Someone was in our house. They broke in through the doors that were still locked after they left. I sighed. Uh, funny how you take Allah's name and then state your belief in superstitious nonsense in the same sentence. While well, she glared daggers at me, I tried to de-escalate. But there's a reasonable explanation for all this, Rabia, I promise. There's no such thing as ghosts or genes. You know that. Her bottom lip quivered. I I'm scared, Irfan. I'm so scared. I, I can't lose her, too. I just can't. I won't survive it. I sat down next to her and took her in my arms. Nothing's going to happen to her, okay? I promise I won't let it. She sobbed into my chest as I rubbed her back. We went back to our bedrooms to lie in our beds and waste the night away trying to catch some sleep that would always be just out of reach. Before going up, I looked at the welcome scribbled on the living room floor and promised myself to scrub it out in the morning. I spent the night in Abida's room as she went and slept next to my wife. Lying in her bed, I turned on my phone's flashlight and read the rules over and over again. Rules for residents of Seastone Ridge. 1. Grass in the lawns must always be cut shorter than 5 inches. 2. Trash collection is on Monday mornings. Garbage bins can only be placed outside after sundown on Sunday evenings, but must be taken back in by 7am on Tuesday. 3. Garage doors cannot be kept open for more than 15 minutes if no work is going on inside. 4. Reasonable noise limits cannot be breached between 9pm and 7am. Mowing the lawn is not allowed in this time period. 5. Any structural modifications to the house require the approval of the HOA. 6. Only shades of colours approved by the HOA can be used to paint the houses. I racked my brain and tried to remember if we'd inadvertently broken one of the rules, but I just couldn't come up with anything. Noise? <laughs> Abida screamed, but that only happened after the intruders came. Garage door? We were moving in, ergo working. Maybe the grass? Well, sure, it could be shorter, but it's not like I'd measured it with a ruler. I then snorted at the fact that I was even entertaining such ridiculous notions, switched off my phone and closed my eyes. Sleep never came to me, as it had been chased away by fear and the resultant adrenaline. Anger was also bubbling in my stomach. How dare they try and traumatise my daughter? Exhausted and sleep-deprived, I shuffled downstairs when the darkness began to dissipate and the sun started climbing the horizon. Well, I'd pretty much scrubbed the living room floor clean when Rabia joined me after finishing up her morning prayers. She was cold with me, which was understandable, but at least she didn't seem as angry as she was the previous night. As she made breakfast, I started unpacking our stuff. The living room was pretty much done by the time Abida came downstairs for breakfast. We ate in silence. Well, mostly. I'm sorry, Baba, Abida whispered. It's my fault. 
It isn't, I replied. It isn't, okay? I believe you. We believe you. We're going to find out whoever did this and turn them over to the police, okay? Tears ran down her cheeks as I squeezed her hand. Rabia looked at me approvingly. After breakfast, I had a short conversation with Rabia and decided to go out and talk to our neighbours about what had happened last night, to check what it was all about and whether it really was an isolated incident or part of an often repeated pattern. I didn't find Amanda as she'd gone to work, even on a Sunday, but I did meet many other people, and surprisingly, maybe perhaps not so surprisingly, the conversation always went the same way. They greet me with a smile on their faces, engage in some awkward small talk and get really uncomfortable when asked about the rules and possible intruders. Oh, you should follow the rules. Always follow the rules, they said. None of them claimed to have seen the police last night. Well, the uh, more people I talked with, the more suspicious I became. They were clearly hiding something, and I was damn sure it had very little to do with anything unnatural, because that's just impossible. Perhaps the most interesting and illuminating conversation I had was with my next-door neighbour, David Easton. It was the one I was least looking forward to, considering he'd been the most hostile to our presence. There was no wind and his flag drooped on the pole in a morose manner as I went up to his door, which he opened before I could even knock. The wrinkles on his face churned as he grimaced at me. Hi, I said. I'm... He interrupted me. I know who you are. Oh, um, well, I was wondering if you... You don't belong here. I blinked. Excuse me, what... You don't belong here, he repeated. Veins writhed like worms under his skin as his eyes flitted around. If I were you, I'd leave. I'd pack my bags and take my family and drive until Seastone Ridge was nothing but an insignificant speck on my rearview mirror. Thanks, but no. Listen, friend, he said caustically. There are things you don't understand about this place. Things you couldn't even dream about in your worst nightmares. Leave, or you'll regret it. And then he slammed the door shut in my face. I was in a daze as I lumbered back to my house. There were a thousand different questions zooming around in my brain. A thousand different possibilities that bloomed in a dizzying mosaic. What was happening here? Was there actually something supernatural tormenting the residents of this community... Or were they all in on it, trying to drive us out of here? But well, why? Nothing made sense. Each alternative seemed more outlandish than the previous one. I told Rabia about my meetings with our neighbours. She looked very frightened and even suggested just moving out of this place. I reminded her of what it had cost to get here and how we'd be in a very precarious financial position if we just upped and left. Uh, she wasn't convinced, but she did go silent after that. After lunch, I went around making sure that we were religiously following the rules of the HOA, just to be extra sure. I even measured the length of the grass with one of Rabbit's rulers, checked the lock on the garage door, made sure that the garbage bin wasn't visible from the outside, and then went back in to continue unpacking. Just to be sure, I even made a phone call and got the locks changed. Well... Things escalated that night anyway. We continued the sleeping arrangements of the previous night, and so after dinner I took the trash bin out and retired to Abita's room. I was so exhausted that my very bones were aching, crying out for some sleep. Even the thought of someone climbing the oak tree and staring at me through the window wasn't enough to keep me alert. I fought hard against the inevitable wave of drowsiness that washed over me, I wanted to be awake in case we got a repeat of last night. And we did. My eyelids were drooping. I was on the verge of sleeping when I heard it. Footsteps. Inside the house. On the staircase. They were slow but drawn out and deliberate. Like the intruder wanted the attention. Each step led to a creak that was abnormally stretched out. 
Storm. 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 God damn. Those floorboards made my heart flutter each time they groaned and shifted under the weight of the intruder. He must have been halfway up the stairs when I jumped out of bed and darted outside the room. I double-checked and made sure that Rabia and Abida were safely locked inside our bedroom before approaching the staircase. Boom. 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 Shivers ran down my spine as the man rushed down the stairs before coming to an abrupt stop. He was at the landing downstairs, and I knew he was watching me, even if I couldn't see him, shrouded as he was by the darkness. I felt horribly exposed under the soft light that spilled out of the bathroom behind me. With trembling hands, I flipped the lights of the stairs on, and my heart pretty much exploded when I saw who, no, what, was standing there. It was a man, I, I think, dressed all in black with long, matted locks of dark hair that seemed to frame what looked like the skull of a goat, stripped down to its bones, with sharp horns that protruded from it and curled half a foot above him menacingly. The eyes of this goat-faced man were large and glowed under the light. My knees wobbled in fear, and I almost collapsed. And then... He bleated. It was shrill, loud, exactly like a goat. My heart raced so fast in my chest I was afraid I was going to die there and then. There I was, at midnight, in my own home, my sanctuary, and there was a terrifying goat-faced man bleating at me. I was in mortal danger, my family too. I had never been this frightened, not even back in Iraq. Just then, when I thought things couldn't get worse, they did. Boom. 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 An explosively loud sound thundered from the outside and continued, in rhythm. It was like someone was beating an infernal drum. It was a momentary distraction. The sound made me turn to my left, to look at the window that opened up to the lawn outside. When I looked back... The intruder, well, that thing, was gone. But the sound didn't stop. I bolted towards the window in Abida's room and peered outside. And there he was, the same goat-faced man, beating on our garbage bin with a hockey stick. Just a couple of seconds ago he'd been right in front of me, in the house, and now suddenly he was outside. Or rather... He'd been outside, beating on the bin the whole time. He'd been staring me down inside. I hesitated, the fear stopping me from moving, but not for long. I hurried out of the bedroom, taking a second to knock on our room to ask Rabia to call 911 before flying downstairs, skidding across the living room floor and flinging the door open. He was still there, standing next to the bin that he'd emptied out long ago. Trash littered our lawn. He glared at me and began bleating again, the obnoxious sound echoing in the street outside. I don't know what came over me, but I ran towards him. Fear and adrenaline were making me act irrationally, but I didn't get very far. I must only have taken a couple of strides when someone turned on the sprinklers. My vision blurred as the warm water crashed into me, and when I shielded my eyes to see clearly, I noticed... That he was gone, vanished into thin air again. Well, by this time, Rabia had turned on all the lights in the house, including the ones on the porch. She ran outside and screamed when she saw me. I looked at her in confusion, before my eyes dropped to my hands. They were dark red, just like my clothes. And that's when I understood what the sprinklers had been spraying wasn't water. It was blood. Part 3 Well, this time the cops had no choice but to file our complaint. I watched them do it too, and made it a point not to change out of my blood-stained clothes until they'd done so. 
Officer Godotchki apologised for not taking us seriously the last night and promised to get to the bottom of it all. He assured us that a patrol car would swing by at night and that they'd come down immediately if things went wrong. His partner, on the other hand, tried to pull me aside to warn me about those rules once again. I exploded. You will do your job now, Officer Schmidt. Thank you very much. Find out whoever is doing this instead of trying to scare me and my wife with your bullshit campfire stories, okay? Well, he looked flabbergasted. I'm just trying to help. I put my hand up to stop him and noticed it was still trembling. Don't, or I'll file a complaint of harassment against you. We're scared enough as it is. We don't need you to pile on top of all that with your nonsense. Well, he tried to say something, but Godotchki stopped him, flashing him a look of annoyance. Hey, leave it. We're done here. The two cops turned on the sprinklers and collected a bottle of the blood that was now saturating the lawn and drove off after the paperwork was done. I stripped off outside, wrung my wet clothes as much as I reasonably could before going back inside. Rabia refused to so much as even look at me. I figured I'd talk to her after I'd cleaned up, and so hopped into the shower upstairs. When I came back out, I found Rabia in the room, hurriedly tossing Abida's clothes into a small suitcase. What are you doing? I asked. Leaving. Leaving? Yes, she muttered. You honestly don't think I'll keep my daughter in this place anymore, do you? We talked about this yesterday. No, she snapped. You talked, I listened, and I'm done listening. We're leaving now. Slow down a second, Rabia, I said, trying to get in her way. Let's talk about this. It was in our house, Irifan, she yelled, her voice cracking as she shoved me aside. It was in our house, again, two nights in a row, and you still don't know how that thing got in. It's madness to stay here, just madness. Things are under control, I said. The cops are involved. We're going to put an end to it, okay? Put an end to what? She asked, her eyes widening in his aspiration. A goat-faced man sneaking in through locked doors, sprinklers gushing blood. You think the cops can help with that? They can't. It's, it's the work of the shaitan. I sighed. Oh. For fuck's sake. Don't cuss at me, she spat. You know I'm right. You saw it with your own eyes. How can you still stand there and say that whatever is going on can all be explained with logic? Damn it, Rabia. Just because we don't know how this asshole is sneaking in doesn't mean it's the devil, I replied, not quite believing myself. The incident had shaken me to the core, allowing doubt and fear to slip in through the cracks. There are no such thing as ghosts and the devil. It's humans, and I'm going to catch them, I swear. And you'll do it alone, she stated firmly. I won't spend another second in this cursed house. And where exactly will you go? A motel or, or whatever. Any place that's not here. So you'll run away? If that's what it takes to protect my child, then yes, I'll run like the wind. She answered. How long are you going to keep running, Rabia? I asked, my jaw clenched. We've been running our whole life. Half of Abida's childhood was spent in cramped bunkers and in the back of trucks. She can't keep living a refugee's life. We have to settle down. For how long are you going to force her to live without roots? As long as it takes, she shot back, because at least she'll be alive this way. I don't... She cut me off. I won't let you do it. I won't let you get her killed too. She screamed that last part. She was practically frothing at the mouth when she said it. She gasped, instantly regretting what she'd said, but it was too late. The damage was done. Her words had cut deep, like a butcher's knife carving pieces out of my soul. I looked at her, blinking to stop tears from pouring out. Do you think... Do you think it's my fault our son is dead? Oh, I didn't mean that, she said hastily. I didn't. It was getting hard to breathe. 
It felt like the walls were going to close in around me and swap me like a mosquito. I waved her off and marched out of the room, tears blurring my vision. Wheezing and with silent sobs racking my chest, I stumbled down the stairs and exited the house before collapsing on the doorstep and weeping like a newborn. I cried as the grief crashed into me all over again. I cried for my boy. Cried at the helplessness I felt at not being able to protect my family. Cried until my wife came and sat down beside me before hugging me. She held me and rubbed my back as I blubbered some nonsense about wanting her to trust me. She then led me back upstairs and made sure I went off to sleep. I wasn't even aware of any of it. I had a decent enough sleep that night. Fear, despair and anger fought a losing battle against exhaustion and I was able to get a bit of rest. It was almost ten o'clock when I woke up. I ran downstairs. They were still there. Abida was helping her mother unpack. My heart fluttered as an intense wave of gratitude and love washed over me, making me shiver. I called in sick that day and promised to join work when I felt better. My boss was understanding and told me to work from home until I was well again. We went to Abida's high school after I finished getting dressed, or what we hoped would become her high school. She had very bright chances of getting in, and it was the first bit of good news we'd received after a horrendous couple of days. Seeing the excited smile on my daughter's face as she took in the sights of the campus made me forget all the messed up stuff I'd seen the night before. In the afternoon, I got a call from Officer Gardokshki, who told me that the blood results had come back. It wasn't human blood. No, it belonged to an animal. A pig. Whoever had put that in our plumbing system knew what they were doing. They knew who we were, what our beliefs were, and wanted to intimidate us, keeping that in mind. When I told this to Rabia, she freaked out and insisted on making sure that we were still following the HOA's rules. She obsessively read that nonsensical document over and over again. I spent the day with her ensuring that everything was in order. We cross-checked the colour our house was painted with the approved list of colours, made sure that the garbage cans were not where they shouldn't be, they never were, checked the lock on the garage, and I even mowed the lawn when we didn't need to. At all. I tried to explain to Rabia that we'd followed the rules to a T, and that whatever was happening here clearly had nothing to do with any of that. It just made her madder, and even more obsessive about the rules. She went out and visited our neighbours herself and came back defeated after learning nothing new. Nothing other than follow the rules. If I'm being honest with myself, I think somewhere deep within me I was lying to myself that by following the rules I wasn't being safe or just doing it for Rabbi's sake, but I was starting to believe that our nightly tormentor might actually be a monster. It was very important for me to disprove that once and for all and so I replaced the light bulb in the basement in preparation for the coming night. I was going to get some answers, one way or another. We stayed in the rest of the day, finished setting up the house, had an early dinner, and went to bed after watching some Netflix. I sat on a chair next to the bed in Abida's room, waiting for our nightly dalliance with the intruders to begin. I'd vowed to myself that, if nothing else... I was going to find out how the fuck he got into the house despite the locked doors. And I did. And what I found froze my heart. It didn't take long for the nightmare to begin. It wasn't even close to midnight when the intruder announced its presence. The sound was short, sharp and rhythmic. Like something metallic being repeatedly smashed against glass. I sat up straight. The source of that sound was somewhere to my left. I turned my neck, just a little, and I saw it. He was there, pressed up against the window, tapping with his gloved hand against the glass. As he saw me looking at his goat-like face, he sped up the tapping until he was knocking on the window in a manic frenzy. My entire body shivered with fear. Move, 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 I screamed at myself. But fear had taken complete control over my senses, 
and this terror only deepened when he started bleating. The sound made my blood run cold. It was so unnatural. How could any human being make that noise? Was my wife right? Had I really been messing with something supernatural? He punched the window in and tossed something inside, and smoke began flooding the room with a sharp hiss. Violent coughs exploded from my chest as the smoke stung my eyes and made them water. It billowed out from that one point, rising until it brushed against the ceiling. So I dropped down and began crawling towards its source. Oh, my throat was so parched that each cough scraped against it and threatened to rip the skin off. Yet water gushed out of my eyes. I ignored my discomfort and crept crawling forward until my hand wrapped around the thing. It was small, cylindrical, and so hot it seared my skin off. I winced, but fought through the pain and tossed that smoke grenade right out. The entire room had been filled with thick plumes of smoke, but the fire alarm never went off. I got up leaning against the wall to support myself as my chest kept getting racked with lung-rattling coughs. Reaching the shattered window, I leaned out and saw him. He was on the lawn, standing still and staring at me. I cursed under my breath, turned around and began running down the stairs. The smoke bomb had shocked me, but there was still time. I could catch him, find out who he was. I bounded down the stairs, fumbled the keys, and threw the door open and stumbled outside. Fuck. He was gone. I went around the outside of the house, ducked under a branch of the tree, and groped around until I found the shell of the smoke grenade, tucked under a slightly overgrown root. As I was inspecting it, I felt light on my face. I looked up. He was there, in the room I'd just been in, framed in smoke and light that he'd just switched on to grab my attention. I froze, not quite believing my eyes. Oh, there's two men, I told myself. Of course that was it. What the fuck else could it be? There's no way he'd moved from out here on the lawn to inside the bedroom just like that, right? That mask was so damn terrifying. Thick black locks contrasting against the shining white of the goat skull. Those curving horns that oozed malice. I shuddered. He moved, disappearing into the smoke and snapping me out of my fear-induced stupor. I ran back to the front door of the house, leaping through the open door. I was there just in time. Just in time to hear the basement door being slammed shut. I dashed towards the door, frantically turning the knob, only to find the damn thing locked. What the fuck was happening here? I didn't know, but I knew that I'd find the answer down there. Before going down into the basement, I went back to the front door and locked it, and then jogged upstairs to check on my family. They were fine, if a little scared. They didn't know about the smoke grenade yet, as most of it had already dissipated. I think I know how they're getting in, I told Rabia. I have an idea, and it's the only one that makes any sense. What are you talking about? she asked. No time to explain, I replied. Call the cops, I'll be right back. I didn't wait for a reply and bolted back down the stairs, only coming to a halt outside the door to the basement. I marveled at the fact that I could still run like that at this age. I shook my head and unlocked the door. I nudged it open, only to be greeted by foreboding darkness. Time to unlock the secrets of this place. I took a deep breath, turned on my phone's flashlight, and began climbing down the rickety wooden stairs. I skipped past an old study table, and moved to the center of the room before pulling on the string of the bolt. Warm light with a yellowish hue flooded the room, and I immediately began my investigation. I tossed the old junk around. Dust-riddled tables, boxes full of kids' toys, stacks of ancient books, and so on, and kept on stomping on the floor, kicking up small clouds of dust in the process. I didn't stop until I found it, just behind the tall cabinet with its door ripped off. As my shoe smashed into the ground, a sound echoed. The ground was hollow, and I knew why. 
I dropped down to my knees, swept my hands on the filthy floor until my fingers brushed against something astonishingly small and metallic. With trembling hands, I pulled the tiny latch of the trap door open and peered down into a small tunnel dug into the floor of my house. Rule number five. Any structural modifications to the house require the approval of the HOA. Part four. It looked like some oversized worm had burrowed into the floor of my basement, carving out a little tunnel to be used at its leisure. It wasn't too big or too small. There was just enough space for an average-sized man to squeeze through. I made a split-second decision, clutched my phone tight in my hands and dropped down into the hole. My feet landed instantly, such that the upper half of my body was still out in the basement. I crouched and crawled into the tunnel through the small fissure near the bottom. The hard ground dug into my elbows and knees as I propelled myself forward. It was cramped, and I could feel the weight of the earth pressing down on my back. The tight, narrow confines of the tunnel made old memories flash through my mind. I remembered hiding in bunkers, huddled together with my family, watching with trepidation as the world shook around us as planes flew overhead and dropped bombs that made dust angrily lash our heads and necks. I shook my head to clear my mind. Oh, can't think about that or I'll pass out in fear, I thought. It was so overwhelmingly dark down there that even my phone's flashlight struggled to light up my way. I couldn't see the end of the tunnel. How long was this thing? Where did it lead to? Who built this? Why? I had so many questions bouncing around in my head that it made my neck hurt. I pushed all thoughts aside and focused on the task at hand. The more I pushed my way through, the more isolated from the world I felt. All it would take is one rumbling, one little yawn from the earth, and I'd be gone forever in a flash, buried under a mountain of debris. I could practically taste the mud in my mouth, feel it constricting my lungs. I had to stop every now and then to breathe. There were even times when I wanted to turn around, not that I could, really, and just wait until the cops arrived. But there was something niggling at the back of my mind, telling me that I had to see this through myself. After what felt like an eternity, I came upon an opening in the tunnel. I slithered out of it like a snake and found that the passageway had become large enough for me to get on my hands and knees. Sighing in relief as oxygen rushed into my lungs. I began to look around. It seemed impossibly long, and went both ways. I popped out somewhere in the middle of this larger tunnel. Once again I wondered who built this, and for what purpose. I picked a direction and began crawling. All my confusion only deepened when I noticed other branches snaking off from the passageway, not dissimilar from the little hole I'd just crawled out of. Did they lead to other houses? What the fuck? There was a whole network of tunnels right beneath our feet. It must have taken a lot of time and planning to build this. But why? Well, I knew I'd find the answers at the end of it all, so I kept on pushing through, after returning to place a handkerchief next to the hole that led back home. The end arrived rather suddenly, as it usually does in life, and I smacked into it head first. I gritted my teeth, rubbed my head, and waited for the pain to subside, before groping around above me for a trap door. Nothing but the immense weight of the earth. I turned around and went back the way I'd come from. I reasoned that both sides couldn't possibly lead to a dead end. Well, this bigger passage had to lead somewhere. And it did. At this end of the tunnel I found myself crouched down just beneath another trap door. The opening here was much larger, and I reasoned that this is where the dig must have begun. Well... Here it goes, I thought. Just one little push and I'd have all my answers. As I prepared to uncover the mystery surrounding Seastone Ridge, I hoped and prayed that our nighttime intruders weren't waiting for me just out there, because that would be a joke of a way to die. I took a deep breath and nudged the trap door open, just a crack, and peered through the tiny slit. Well, it looked like another basement, but whose? I tried to check my surroundings as much as I reasonably could, and when I was reasonably sure that no one was there, I flung the trap door open and climbed out into the basement. The place was quite unlike ours. For one, it was clean. 
there was no clutter, and secondly, it was a wine cellar. Rows upon rows of floor-to-ceiling shelves stocked with delicately expensive liquor filled up the room. Where the fuck was I? Well, I didn't have to wait long to get an answer. I was debating with myself as to what my next step would be when I heard it. Keys jiggling as one is being slid into a lock. I slipped into a dark corner and waited. The door swung open. Light from the hallway beyond poured into the basement. Footsteps clicking on the stairs. I saw heels and then the hem of a red cocktail dress. And then the laughter. High-pitched, jovial. I recognised it. Didn't have to see her face to know who it was. To know whose house I was in. But I got the confirmation anyway as she came down and switched on the lights. I ducked and hid to avoid being seen as she started searching through the shelves, trying to pick out some suitable liquor for her small house party, allowing me the chance to get a good look at her face through the gap between two wine bottles. It was Amanda, the president of the Homeowners Association of Seastone Ridge. My heart hammered in my chest. What does this all mean, I thought. As president of the HOA, she's got to be aware that there's a tunnel underneath her house, right? Was she the one who's been tormenting us all this time? Using her basement as a launching pad to send that asshole our way. But maybe not. Maybe it was someone else and she's completely unaware of it. One of the other residents, or even a former resident who built these tunnels to perv on his neighbours... And these modifications broke the rules and released some supernatural entity. But that was ridiculous. You can't pull something like this off without anyone else figuring it out, right? Surely the others know, and if they do, why didn't they try to correct the damage by filling these tunnels up? That would have been my first response if I'd known that these tunnels released some subterranean monster. Besides, if that's really what happened... Why aren't the other houses getting harassed with the same intensity that we are? There was only one obvious answer, and it all went back to Amanda. I didn't stick around for long. As soon as she left the cellar, down I went into the tunnel, crawling my way back to my house. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what was happening here. Was it really Amanda? Were the others involved? Why were they doing this? It seemed like the more I uncovered about the community, the more questions that popped up, like a messed up game of whack-a-mole. I was back in my house before the two cops arrived. They took the used-up smoke grenade as evidence and promised to try and track down where it had come from. They said that a patrol car had come by, but must have missed the intruders. I didn't tell them about the tunnel. I wanted to keep my cards close to my chest and think this thing through. There was no one in this neighbourhood that I fully trusted apart from my family. I saw the cops off, kissed my daughter goodnight, and talked to Rabia, who didn't once ask me why I'd changed out of my suddenly filthy clothes before the cops had arrived. That intruder is not going to come into this house again, I stated, fully feeling the confidence with which I'd said that. She raised her tired eyes at me, exhaustion and a tiny flicker of hope on her face. How? Are you sure? I kissed her on the forehead. It'll be over soon. Trust me. The next morning found me at my neighbor's doorstep. I'd thought long and hard about this, and had arrived at the conclusion that I needed to have one more conversation with the guy. It was a surprisingly windy day, and the American flag flew proudly from its pole as I knocked on David Easton's door. <sighs> it's you. He remarked blandly after opening the door. You're still here? Yes, I am, I replied, putting my hands on my waist. <sighs> what do you want? He asked gruffly. I was wondering if you had an axe or something. Why? Well, I'm thinking of cutting down the oak tree next to my house. Did you get permission from the HOA? Nope. Oh, you'll be forced to pay a hefty fine. The HOA doesn't... Fuck the HOA. He paused for a long second, and then his icy facade cracked into a most satisfied grin. <sighs> Wait just a second now. He shut the door on my face, and I tapped my foot as I waited for him to come back out. It didn't take long. Must have only waited a couple of minutes before he was out. 
a keychain dangling from his belt. An axe is not going to do it, you know, he said as he started walking towards his garage without explicitly asking me to follow him. We're not at the age where we can bring down a tree just by swinging our arms. <laughs> Speak for yourself, old man, I muttered. He laughed. <laughs> Thankfully, we have tools that can just help us get the job done without throwing our backs in. He slipped the key into the padlock and pulled the shutter of his garage up. I'm surprised Amanda hasn't asked you to bring your garage to the 21st century, I said. Oh, my house was here before the HOA was formed, he replied. She can't touch me. There it is, he said, pointing to the power saw placed on a shelf next to his pickup truck. This beauty will slice through that wood like it was butter. He yanked open a couple of drawers, looked through some more shelves and retrieved two safety goggles and some flat objects I'd never seen before. What's that? I asked. Tree felon wedges, he answered. Make sure that damn thing doesn't come crashing down on your house. I led him back to my house and we went around to the side until we reached the oak tree. You really want to bring the whole thing down? He asked as we stood in the shade of the tree. We could just cut down that branch over there. He pointed to the one that slithered its way up to the window upstairs, the one on which that intruder had been standing when he threw that smoke grenade in. I stared at him. How did you know I have a problem with that one? He shrugged. We stretched the power cord of the saw through a window and shoved it into a socket in the living room. I winked when Rabia shot me a questioning look, and she shook her head. Once I was back outside, David gestured at me to put on the safety goggles, and then revved up the saw before beginning the cutting process. It took a while, but we sliced that offending branch off, and it crashed into the ground. That fucker wasn't getting in that easily anymore. It'd make for some decent firewood, David remarked when we were taking a rest, surrounded by wood and sawdust littering the lawn. Yep, it would, I mumbled before raising my voice a little. You know, I met a lot of people here when we first moved in. They all said the same thing. Welcome to the community. Nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And then they warned me about the HOA's rules. Every single one of them. Except you. He looked at me blankly. You were warning me, weren't you? I asked. I mean, honestly warning me. You knew what was wrong with this place and wanted us to get out. To save ourselves, right? He looked away, before gently nodding. Ah, you seem like good, honest folk. Made no sense to let the darkness of this place infest your lives. Then why do you stay here? I continued. If you know what's happening here, whatever this is, well, why stay? Ah, too many fucking memories, he answered. Spent my whole life here. Raised a family. Lost a family. Oh, I'm too old to move out now. I paused and began picking at the log of wood next to me. I heard that you lost your son. He tensed up before his shoulders deflated with a long exhale, a century's worth of exhaustion in that one action. It was an IED blast. Didn't even get the chance to bury him properly. He paused. I'd spoken to him the night before. His leave had been approved. My boy... He he was so excited about coming back home. And he did, just not the way I wanted him to. He sniffled. I lost my son too, I replied after a couple of heavy seconds. I still remember it like yesterday. He didn't want to go to school that day. He was faking a cold. I blinked, letting tears fall from my eyes. If I hadn't forced him to go that day. He started to tear up as well. I continued. I saw it happen. I was there to picking up from school. Heard the plane fly overhead. Felt the cloud of dust in my face. That smell of charred flesh, desperately sifting through the rubble. My voice began to crack. I found him, you know. He was so broken, my son, he... Couldn't finish my sentence and just broke down crying. David joined me in letting out his grief. There we were, two fathers who'd lost their sons to what was pretty much the same war, dealing with and 
pondering over our loss halfway round the world. My chest felt incredibly lighter after having talked with David, and I assumed it was the same for him. We cleared the lawn of the fallen wood and carried it back to his truck. He said he knew how to get rid of it, and I was just glad it wasn't littering my lawn anymore. You really should leave, you know, he remarked once we were back inside his garage. It's far too dangerous to stay here. Might be, I replied, but I can't run away. When we came to this country, my daughter made me promise that we wouldn't run away any more. Whatever it is, we'll face it head on. His eyes hardened at that. Well then, you're going to need some help. He beckoned me to follow him as he led me to the back of his garage, to an iron safe fixed into the wall. He used his keys to open it, and pulled out a small pistol, a Beretta M9. Know how to use this? he asked. I nodded. Had to learn along the way. Good, he said as he pushed it into my hand before going back to the safe and getting me a small box of bullets. Are you sure? I asked. Yep, he replied. Do what you can to keep your family safe, your father. And maybe when this storm blows over, we can get together for a drink. I shook his hand, tucked the gun into the waistband of my jeans, and walked away before I wound up crying once again. The air was sizzling with tension as I walked back into my house. I could feel the gazes of the other neighbours like little daggers at the back of my neck, some with a mix of fear and curiosity, others with naked hatred in their eyes. Was that anger because we were still here, or because they'd noticed I'd cut down the tree, a gross violation of the HOA's rules? David was right. A storm was brewing in Seastone Ridge, one that would forever change the community. I spent the day with my family, assuring them it would all come to an end the following night. In the afternoon, I sat on my computer and got some work done before spending the evening with my family. My wife cooked up some delicious cussy for dinner, and the lamb was so delicious it made me forget about my worries while I was eating it. And it was Abida's favourite dish too. Rabia only worked as hard as she did to cook it to see her smile. Oh, there's nothing a parent wouldn't do for their child's happiness, is there? I know I'd do absolutely anything. And that's why after Rabia and Abida had gone to bed, I was sitting on a chair in the dark basement, off to the side of the trap door with a gun in my lap. That fucker was going to have a nasty surprise when he tried to sneak in this time. Half an hour before midnight, I was wide awake, tension turning my stomach in knots, body drenched in sweat, hands trembling with excitement. I heard it, shuffling movements just beneath the floor. The trapdoor moved. I pulled the gun up, took aim. A slight groan, a soft creak. And the trap door opened. Part 5 The trap door swung open with a practiced ease, and dark silhouette began to emerge. Even in the darkness of the basement, the white of the goat skull stood out bright enough to easily be spotted. The intruder began pulling himself up. Hey, I whispered. The man gasped, startled. He turned sharply. A flash of light, a loud bang. The body jerked over backwards as the wall behind him was painted red. I waited a second for the ringing in my ears to clear before getting up and trotting towards the body. I crinkled my nose at the stench of gunpowder and checked his pulse and confirmed that he was dead. Must have been one terrifying death. Imagine getting out of a tunnel into a basement to attack a family, day after day, having the full confidence of knowing you are going to be alone. And then suddenly, one day, you're not. It just so happens to be the very last day of your life. I had no sympathy for the man I'd just killed. I did what I had to do to protect my home and my family. Leaving the body alone for a moment, I got up and pulled on the string hanging from the ceiling allowing harsh yellow light to flood into the small basement. 
My actions felt far more real when taken out of the shadows and examined under the light. My heart raced and my legs wobbled as I realized I'd just killed a man, something I hadn't done in over a decade. I closed my eyes and counted to ten to calm myself down. When it felt like I was back in control, I crouched down over the oddly contorted body and began pulling the mask off. It was heavy, and the substance with which it had been made was hard, like it was made out of actual bone. I pulled it off and stumbled back when I saw who it was that I was looking at, who it was that had been invading my house, and who it was that I had just killed. It was Joseph Gardochki, the cop. I swore under my breath. This man had been showing up each night, promising to find the intruders when he himself was the one tormenting us. But why, though? I searched the corpse, patted his pockets and retrieved his ID, his wallet, a phone and some lockpicks. As I continued searching, his shirt bunched up and I noticed some tattoos on his belly. With clammy hands that were shaking wildly, I pulled his shirt up to get a closer look at these tattoos. My heart sank. His entire torso was tatted up. Swastikas, iron crosses, imperial German flags, hateful phrases like Blut und Er, Weissmarkt. His body was a canvas for neo-Nazi imagery. Of course they wanted us out. They hated us for who we were. It was a miracle they hadn't tried to kill us yet. Wait a second, I thought. If this guy was here, then that means his partner was involved as well. Of a king course. There were two of them. They must have been working together to give the false impression that there was only one supernatural monstrosity. It was probably Amanda who told Schmidt to repeatedly warn Rabia about the rules, to try and reinforce the idea that there was some otherworldly evil entity prancing around in the neighborhood. Oh, those bastards. A terrible screech pierced the silence that had enveloped the basement. Oh, fuck. It was Schmidt. He was in the house. I whirled around and began running up the stairs. Flinging the basement door open, I darted to my right, slipped past the furniture of the living room and arrived at the foot of the stairs that led up to the first floor. Another scream, followed by loud banging, like a hammer pounding a slab of wood. I sprinted up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my chest burning from the lack of oxygen. I arrived at the landing, turned and looked down the hallway. There he was, swinging away at the master bedroom door with an axe. By Allah's grace, the wood was strong and was still holding on, though some wide cracks had started to show. I took a deep breath to steady myself as Officer Schmidt continued bringing his axe down on the door. I couldn't rush this. My family was just beyond that door, and I couldn't with a hundred percent certainty assume that they weren't in the line of fire. I couldn't miss. I had to get the bastard with this one shot. I brought the gun up, exhaled, waited for my hand to stop shaking, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet hit him in the back of his neck, and he folded, slumping against the door with a sickening crunch. I tucked the gun in my belt, strode over to the body and pulled it off the door. Popping his mask off, I confirmed that it was Officer Schmidt's body, before getting up and knocking on the door. Rabia, I said, my voice shaky from the adrenaline. Open the door, it's me. I heard footsteps, and then the door was thrown open. My wife and daughter jumped into my arms, and I comforted them. It's over now. It's over for good. Sidestepping the corpse of Officer Schmidt, I brought my family to Abida's room and gave them a quick rundown on what had happened. Abida looked horrified at the scale of it all, while Rabia seemed angry that I didn't tell her about the tunnel, or the gun that David had lent me. I was going to be in a lot of trouble for the lies and the secrets, but well, I was fine with that. I had my reasons for going about things the way I did. They both gawped at me in shock when I told them that the HOA was behind all this and that the two men I'd just killed were the cops who'd been coming to our house under the pretext of helping us, when they were, in fact, the reason why we called 911 in the first place. I wasn't finished talking when the bedroom windows in the room were lit up with flashes of red and blue. Looks like the police are here, 
Rabia stated, relieved. It's finally over. But my eyes widened in alarm. What's wrong, Yevon? She asked. I put my finger on my lips and told her to be quiet. I tiptoed over to the window, the one that opened up to the lawn, and not the one that was smashed last night. Pulled aside the curtains and peered outside. There were two cop cars and dozens of people, our neighbours, out on my lawn. How did the police get there so quickly? We didn't call them. And that means it must have been one of the neighbours. And the fact that they hadn't done so in the last couple of days, but chose to do so now, made anxiety worm its way into my belly. Were there other members of the local law enforcement who were involved in this shit? Well, my suspicions were confirmed when I saw Amanda chatting with the cops. They're not here to help us, I whispered. What? Rabia asked. They've come to finish the job. I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket, and it nearly gave me a heart attack. I breathed out in relief when I saw who was calling. Hello, I said, answering the call. Don't let him in. David's voice crackled into my ears. They're Nazis, I said. I know. Yeah, yeah, they are. I heard gunshots. Did you? Yes. He paused. You need to get out of there. They won't let us, I pointed out. Oh, you have no choice now, he said, cutting the call. I deliberated on our options. Should we do as David says and try and escape? Or try and reason with them? Oh, there's no way we can talk. Not after I killed two of them. Try and fight and wait for some good police to come out. But would they? How many cops are in on this? And could we last until then? Well, I had just the one gun. Who knew what they were packing? Mr. Abbas, a loud voice boomed, cutting off my chain of thought. I crawled to the window and peeked outside. One of the cops was speaking into an electric megaphone. We received a complaint about gunshots from your house. If everything is... Amanda snatched the mic away from him. You killed them, didn't you? She shrieked. You'll pay for this, you mother. Oh, I'm going to slaughter you all. There won't be enough pieces of you left to bury, you goat fucking piece of shit. She threw the mic back at the cop and screamed at him. He looked offended, but nodded his head. He signaled at the other cops and they began moving towards the house. I panicked, took the gun out and pushed the window open and fired at the invaders, emptying the clip in one go. I was terrified, but my aim wasn't that bad. They were running in the open and I got two of them, one in the eyeball and the other in the neck. Blood sprayed out of their wounds like punctured water balloons, and they both crashed onto the ground ungracefully. My wife and daughter let out muffled screams of fear. The remaining cops retreated, finding cover behind their cars as the other neighbors scattered away like ants from a flooded nest. Some would return, however, lugging rifles and pistols of different makes. Together, the cops and residents of Seastone Ridge began their assault on our home, trying to turn the walls of our house into Swiss cheese. I fell down and hugged the floor, instructing my family to do the same. The world exploded around us in a hail of deafening gunfire. Shattered glass, bits of concrete, splintered wood rained down on us as bullets mercilessly punched into the house. I crawled out of the bedroom and motioned to my wife to follow me. I spotted Abida shivering on the floor, her ears covered, eyes squeezed shut. I grabbed her leg and shook it. She kicked and pulled her leg away. We have to go, I screamed, trying to make myself heard over the gunshots. Now! I shook her leg again, finally getting her attention. Her eyes were wide and her whole body was trembling. Oh, damn it, not now. It would be beyond terrible if she were to have a panic attack with all this going on. We have to go, I mouthed at her, and she nodded. Good. I told Abida to stick close to me and we began moving downstairs. Oh, she was still shaking so badly, it both scared and angered me. Those Nazi bastards. As we crawled down like worms, bullets punched through the wall, allowing moonlight to filter in, 
lighting up the staircase in the process. It was terrifying. One stroke of bad luck, one misstep, and we were dead. But luck was on our side that night, not theirs, and we made it to the bottom safely. Surprisingly enough, as we reached the living room, we noticed that bullets were no longer entering the house, though the gunfire continued unabated. I didn't figure out until later what had happened. The pause in bullets whizzing past us gave me a bit of confidence, and I got up on my hands and knees and sped up as I made my way to the kitchen. Abida and Rabia followed suit. Reaching the door that opened to the garage, I got up and shoved it open. Get in, I yelled, opening the car doors, the gunfire sounding even louder in the garage. Down there. I pushed them onto the floor of the car, in the space between the front and the back seats. After making sure they were safely tucked in, I leapt into the driver's seat. I revved the car up before clicking the button to slide the automatic garage door open, thanking the stars that it wasn't like the door David had in his garage. Muzzle flashes brightened my vision as the door went up, revealing the outside to me. I noticed many bodies sprawled on the ground, far more than I'd last seen. What had happened here? I got my answer when I pressed my foot on the gas, zoomed out of the garage and entered the street. The cops and the HOA were no longer firing at our house, because they were busy shooting at David's place, who'd surprised them and laid waste to about half their numbers. As the car skidded on the asphalt and made a sharp turn, out of the corner of my eye I even spotted Amanda, lifelessly slumped against a cop car. Seemed like David had another gun hidden away somewhere. Stay safe, my friend, I thought as I tore through the neighborhood, leaving the grotesque war behind in the rear-view mirror. Oh, they peppered us with bullets, blowing out the rear windshield, but we safely made it to the front gate of Seastone Ridge only to find it locked. The staccato gunfire had trailed off to the odd shot here and there. I climbed out of the car and tried to pry the gate open, when a bullet sparked against it inches from my hand. I ducked and hid behind the car. Bracing against the hood, I pushed my legs against the gate after pulling the latch open. Another bullet smashed into the side of the car. I swore and took my gun out of the glove box. It was empty. Fuck. I slid the magazine out and began shoving some bullets into it. The security guard of the community jumped out from behind a wall and began jogging towards us, a rifle in hand. Oh, damn. Not now. Not like this. Not when we were so close. Baba, Abida said, her head rising. My eyes widened. The guard got close to the car, brought his gun up, he had her in his sight, but I was quicker, and my aim was perfect. I opened up a hole in the middle of his forehead, jumped back into the car, and drove out of the neighborhood. That night our neighborhood was witness to unbelievable carnage. Over a dozen corpses littered the streets, and property worth millions was destroyed. But that wasn't the worst of it. No. David, that clever bastard baited some of them into coming down into the underground tunnel and set off a minor explosion, burying them alive. And that marked the end of that assault. The events of that night had far-reaching consequences for our small town. The local police department was utterly destroyed as many of its personnel, including some senior officers, were exposed for having links to local neo-Nazi gangs. Some were arrested, some were fired, others got away with plausible deniability, but they never bothered anyone again. Over half the neighborhood was put behind bars, at least those who survived. We finally found out what Amanda and her coterie wanted. Their plan was to establish a semi-autonomous white nation-state that had very limited contact with the outside world and allowed no minorities. Well, they screwed up by not buying off the realtor, I guess. One little mistake and Amanda ended up with a hole in her face, courtesy of one David Easton. Oh, he uh, survived, by the way. Tough bastard escaped out the back door while they were invading his house. He was upset about having to do all that repair work, but, but civil lawsuits ensured he didn't have to spend much out of his own pockets. We moved back into Seastone Ridge. 
The money we got from the lawsuits was enough to put Abida through college and rebuild the house from the ground up. Rabia, bless her soul, stayed with me, despite my utterly reckless behaviour. We got counselling, and have come out as a stronger couple. Things are different in Seastone Ridge now. The HOA has been disbanded. A Korean family has moved into Amanda's house. There's genuine happiness in the air now. It feels like a real neighbourhood, with barbecues and all. And sometimes on the weekends, David and I sit out on his deck, drink beer, and talk about our children. Burning down the Ozark. Another day, another dollar towards beer money. I thought as I pulled into my company's parking lot. As I walked into the office, I heard the gruff, deep voice of my manager Jerry say, Hey Bob, you going out of area today? Out of area, meaning I was going to be driving to the middle of nowhere, get maybe one job completed, and have to be back here by sundown. As I was pondering my shitty situation, Jerry walked up to me and slapped me on the back like a mildly alcoholic dad who doesn't know the meaning of too hard and said, You hear me, Bobby? Yep, I'm making less money for the good of the company, right? Jerry's brow furrowed. The sarcasm in my voice was almost beyond his grasp, but eventually he got it. Listen here, you little ass clown. The company will pay you double for your gas. We'll take your drive into account for your bonus and give you free service for your truck. They treat us good if you do good by them. Jerry, a portly, balding, middle-aged, middle manager, gave the same speech in the same tone to anyone who'd ever complained about doing anything extra. Of course, though, I had to ask him why the heck I had to do it today. Because Roger, Jerry said, referring to the guy that worked the northernmost tip of our area, decided that he hated you and called off this morning. Yeah, but why am I the one who has to take his work? I asked, mildly surprised of Jerry's own sarcasm. Because I think you're a limp dead asshole who needs to learn him some work ethic. Don't go talking about how you served in the Marines and you worked hard. Blah, 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 blah. I fought in the Gulf under General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, and I know hard work. People like you turn the Corps into a bunch of pussies. Oh, Jerry, if you didn't notice, was a Marine like myself but he served in the Corps in the time before the pussy generation, as he so eloquently dubbed millennials. But, to be honest, he was a warehouse manager, like he is now, while when I was in the Corps, I was busy dodging pissed-off Taliban snipers and IEDs, so screw him. Yeah, I know, Jerry, I'm a pussy, because I actually wore my body armor, but, anywho, before we start a dick-measuring contest, where the hell am I going? I asked, trying to avoid our normal arguments. Jerry sighed and said, Out in the Ozarks, near Grand Gap. Grand Gap. Literally a post office and a general store smack dab in the middle of a massive forest. This place is on a side road driveway that goes for about two miles off of AR-7. The customer needs two rooms done with a satellite dish set up. Jerry finished. He sounded like he may have felt bad because he knew how much I hate setting up those dishes. And on top of that, the chance of us actually getting a signal for the satellite was little to none. So, I'm driving 120 miles out to the mountain so I can tell some backwards inbred that he can't get his TV because of the trees. God, I must have been a murderer in a mass life, man. I complained. And yes, Jerry, I friggin' know I'll be compensated regardless. A couple of minutes later, I loaded up my truck and started the long trip north into the mountains and away from the safety of familiarity. I knew the drive would take well over an hour and a half on relatively empty roads, so I started to let my mind wander. I've been with cable, satellites, and more for about two years now, and it still amazes me I haven't quit and or killed myself yet. The hours suck, the pay is subpar, and upper management spends most of their time on their knees sucking off the big cable companies, begging for scraps. Now, you may be asking yourself, how the hell did a combat veteran with access to the GI Bill and four years of leadership training end up installing cable in Arkansas? Well, the best way to answer that is, instead of taking classes and getting a skilled labor job, I wanted to be a badass. At 18, I only wanted one gig. 
the infantry. Gives you the ability to act under pressure and learn how to lead men into combat. But when you get out, most jobs want people with applicable skills. So I tried college, a state school filled with former professionals turned professors, expansive libraries brewing with information, companies from all over the world recruiting to get the pick of the best candidates. Oh, and girls, lots and lots of girls. Now, I probably don't have to tell you, but I only paid attention to the last one. You see, when you spend four years of your life surrounded by dudes, a plethora of chicks in yoga pants kind of distracts you. Seriously, being the only non-bearded, non-vaping alpha male on campus got me laid a lot. Like I'm talking Ron Jeremy's hairy ass would have been jealous of me. Well, for my frequency of fornication, not my GPA. But shit happens. And I got this gig while I was directionless. Oh, directionless, by the way, is the word used to describe me by my court-appointed therapist. I'll leave most of the details out, but some punk bitch decided to tell me not to sleep with his girlfriend while I was at state. Well, I decided him eating my fist would be the best way for me to convey my feeling of distaste for his sentiment. One thing led to another. I have to go see a shrink for my PTSD. <sighs> PTSD my ass. I liked what I did over there. Get up, go on patrol... Possibly shoot some hodges and then go back to the FOB. Simple. Now life's complicated. I've got to pay rent, I have to be politically correct, and I can't shoot anyone, even the people who drive slowly in the left freaking lane. Uh, whatever. Maybe I'll be lucky and whoever this customer is will be a super hot art student, staying at her parents' cabin for winter break. She'll answer the door half naked, take one look at my manly frame, hopefully ignoring the pudge hanging over my belt and invite me in to help her keep warm for the winter. I <laughs> let my thoughts wander, thinking about the pretty blonde, no, maybe brunette, waiting for me. Well, looking back, I really wish that was the case. As I got closer to the address, the GPS on my phone started acting a bit finicky, but it was able to steer me to the right driveway. Well, driveway was a word... It was more or less a dirt path shrouded by old-as-hell white oak and cottonwood. I heard leaves and pines crackle under the weight of my truck as I steered down the narrow track. As I drove deeper, I noticed that this part of the forest was dense and looked barely touched. See, I went camping in the Ozarks every year with my dad up until I was 17. Almost everywhere we went, you could tell the woods had been affected by people in some way. You know, random piece of trash, carved initials of young lovers, tire or human tracks and all that shit. Well, these trees, this path and everything it encompassed seemed to have remained unscathed, even though someone apparently lived out here. It was strange to say the least, especially because there seemed to be no tire tracks going up the driveway. The path dragged on and on and it seemed to narrow out to the point where I didn't think I could fit my truck on it much longer. Then I saw a small patch of brighter earth and an open area about 200 yards ahead of me. I silently thanked the man upstairs that I wouldn't have to lug all my equipment through the woods. As I approached the opening, I caught my first glimpse of the house, or better yet, shit pile that I'd be working on today. It stood, well, slumped, at around two stories, with rotted wood siding and maybe two out of ten windows not smashed in. The front lawn was just dirt, leaves, and pines scattered around. I couldn't freaking believe my eyes. God, how am I supposed to install TV boxes when there's no power? I thought. This is probably some redneck with a makeshift wind turbine strapped to a tree. Probably going to ask why he can't get his NASCAR. I scanned for the front door and saw a dilapidated plank covering the largest of the house's orifices. I decided that was my best bet as a front door. At this point, I was just honestly hoping no one was home. There was no car, everything was overrun, and there couldn't possibly be a decent source of power anywhere on this property. But God was definitely not on my side that day. As I approached the front door, I saw movement beyond one of the non-smashed-in windows. I may have seen some shit overseas, but someone actually living out here in this busted house couldn't be someone I wanted to be alone with. But if I didn't at least try to complete the job, I wouldn't get paid any bonus. As I arrived to the plank door, I slowly reached my hand to knock, but before I could reach it, it swung open. Behind the door was a person, at least what was left of a person after spending a few months at a concentration camp. 
Well, this guy stood at six foot tall, no more than 120 pounds, white as a ghost and seemed to be made of only bones and thinly stretched skin. It looked like someone had sucked all the fat and sinew out of his body. But the creepiest part was his eyes. They seemed empty, the pupils so expansive that I couldn't make out the color and barely see the whites. I realized I'd been staring and looked down at my paperwork. Uh, good morning, sir. Is this the residence of Mr. Vidher? I barely got it out before he opened the black hole that was his mouth. Why have you come? His words rolled off his tongue, heavily laden with a thick, syrupy Scandinavian accent. Here I was trying to install a satellite for Count Dracula, and he doesn't ask me what I want or who I am, but why have I come? Who the hell says that? I'm your cable technician, here to get your TV set up, I stammered. It was all I could do to get out of his pitch black eyes staring right through me. I continued to stare for what felt like an hour until he opened the hole in his face. Oh yes, come forth into my house. I will show you where you will be working, but be warned, I do not like anything in my home touched. Your business here is the televisions only. Is that understood? Oh, this guy looked like freaking Skeletor and sounds like a James Bond villain, I thought. Well, aloud, I said, Yes, sir, I won't touch any of your stuff, or knickknacks or personals. Just want to set up the TVs and head back to Little Rock. He stared at me for a second and turned back towards the dark house, beckoning for me to follow. As I trailed my gaunt host into the ramshackle house, I couldn't help but notice the nauseating scent of decaying meat, mixed with a tinge of rusted copper. It was as if I'd wandered into an abandoned slaughterhouse and I could smell the years of blood and decomposition of millions of animal parts. Oh, don't think like that, man. This guy's probably a hunter. Lives off the grid and finally decided he missed ESPN and called us up, I thought. But the smell wasn't the only off-putting characteristic of Mr. Vidhair's home. It was the decor, or rather the lack thereof. The front door opened directly into what can barely be described as a living room. The only sign that an actual human lived here was a decrepit rocking chair that looked like it was the sole survivor of Dresden. The wood was badly scorched, and the only parts that weren't burned were heavily frayed. I felt like if I sat down in it, I'd be pulling a thousand splinters out of my ass and wiping flecks of charred wood off my pants for eternity. I took my eyes off the chair and finally saw the TV I'd been connecting the receiver to. Now, I say TV sarcastically because I'm pretty sure the set I grew up with 29 years ago was more advanced. I saw that the ancient beast still had the original wood panelling and everything. I hope to God I had some sort of adapter in the truck because no way I was telling Dr. Frankenstein I didn't have the parts. Now, this is the first television. It is a Zenith from 1949. I was told your company specialized in connecting New Age media to these types of TV sets, am I correct? Mr. Vidher turned and looked at me with his empty eyes as he asked this. Well, I should be, I can always figure it out, I lied. Well, the oldest TV I'd set up was from the 90s. I am so screwed, I thought. I'm going to punch that punk bitch Roger in the freaking throat as soon as I see him. Asshole better buy me a beer for calling out. Good. I would be very disappointed if I do not have my shows. Vidher, I think, smiled as he said this, and put an intense emphasis on very. He let me pause in the living room to assess the back of the TV. One look was all I needed. One look told me I was utterly fucked. This TV did not have a single connection I recognized. But I had an idea. The job description I'd received for Mr. Vidher stated he did not want satellite on the roof. He wanted it on a pole, and from my experiences with these types of mounts, there is a high chance that this guy won't get a signal, or the ground ain't right for a mount. All I had to do was take my satellite reader and pretend there wasn't a trace of a signal. Oh, and I forgot to mention, explain to this guy he wasn't getting his shows until my manager came out and verified it. Yeah, fuck it. Jerry can die for the company he loves. I'll get over it. As my spirit started to lighten, and my mood turned from depressed and terrified to less depressed and slightly hopeful, 
my customer decided I was staring at his TV for too long. I'll lead you to the next TV. Hopefully this one will not take too long for you to study. He sounded pissed, so I gave him the go-ahead to bring me further into his creepy-ass house. So I uh, saw the power outlet behind the TV, but no power lines to the house. Is there a generator connected somewhere? I had to ask because I didn't hear the loud hum of a generator, nor did I see any sign of power being run to the house. My host turned to look at me with his vacant eyes and hissed, How my homework should not concern you. As he said this, I could see what little blood this guy had in his body rush up to his face. Well, he was angry and seemed barely able to contain it. He turned back around and started heading further and faster towards the back of the house. I was about to apologize as I fought to keep up with him, but something caught my eye. There was a picture on the wall, one of those old-timey portraits you see in people's grandparents' house. I could only get a quick look, but from what I could tell, even in black and white, one of the men in the portrait looked exactly like Mr. Vidhair, like to a T. The only difference was the guy in the picture had normal eyes and didn't look so disproportionate. It couldn't be him. This picture had to be from the 1880s or something. Vidhair stopped abruptly. Before I could finish studying the picture, and pointed toward an open doorway to our right. He said, This is where the last TV is, and it is exactly like the first one. Do you need to stare at it incessantly, or will the information I have given you be enough? And as he asked this, I could literally feel the sarcasm and frustration pouring out of him. Oh, what the fuck is this guy's problem, I thought. Then aloud I said, with a forced smile, um, Just knowing the type and where it is will be enough for me. The weirdo seemed satisfied with my answer and took me a bit further to a back door, flanked by two more busted-out windows. He opened the door and walked through them to the backyard, which was as equally disheveled as the front. Okay, sir. I know you want the satellite somewhere in the yard, so I'm going to go ahead and try and find a signal. I'll come knock on the door when I do. He looked at me and said, I will stay outside. You seem young and I generally do not trust the youth. Well, how the fuck are you supposed to respond to that? I looked over at Mr. Creepy and said, Um, okay. Well, it's kind of boring, but feel free to watch. No other way to follow someone telling you he doesn't trust you. Well, who could blame him? I was planning on saying there was no signal, even if there was one, and going home. As I started wandering around the yard, hitting random buttons on my signal finder to further help my goal of pretending to find a signal, I was able to take in more of my host. His eyes and ugly-ass face kept me from looking at what he was wearing. His clothing looked as worn as he did. His long black coat was covered in Irish pennants and his white button-up shirt was slathered in old stains. Jeez, this guy really is all kinds of fucked up, I thought. As I was wandering around the yard, I also noticed something else that was a bit suspect. Every three to five yards or so, there seemed to be little holes recently covered up. It was like he was planting a garden, or maybe some trees. Well, I would have asked, but he was clearly not much of a conversationalist. After about ten minutes of drifting around and hitting random buttons, my host's eyes never left me, I decided it was now or never to tell him I had no signal. Sir, I hate to say this, but due to the trees in the area, I have no line to your provided satellite. Well, to me, the only option would be to remove some of the foliage. I was barely able to finish before the anger flashed in his big dead eyes and the blood rushed to his face again. You will not touch any of my trees. They are precious to me. As he screamed this, he closed the ten-yard gap between us in three steps. And you will give me my shows. He was so close to me by this point that the lifeless holes on his face were mere centimeters away. Okay, this was my final freaking straw with this goddamn psycho. But alas, I'd lose my gig if I blew up on one more customer. I took a deep breath and said in my best customer service voice, I understand you're upset, sir. I think the best way to resolve this dilemma is to try and get my manager out here. Well, to myself, I thought, yeah, fuck Jerry. Let's see how tough his old core is when he meets this crazy mother. As I said this, Vidhair seemed to settle down and the blood stopped pooling in his face. Very well, but 
You must know I care very deeply about my forest. You mustn't harm it in any way, he said, still containing a hint of his anger. What needs to be done next? Well, I need to go get the proper form for you to sign, and then we can go ahead and call Jerry, my manager. Don't worry about the trees, we won't touch them, I said, trying not to smirk. Is this Jerry as insolent as you, and as uncaring about my forest? He asked with heavy disdain. I looked up at him, trying with all my might not to look pissed, and said, only slightly sarcastically, I might add, well, not at all. He's a perfect gentleman, and he loves trees. I mean, the guy has at least twelve in his backyard. Somehow this satisfied the tree-loving psycho. Okay, well, I'm going to run over to my truck and get the forms. Want to meet me inside? I asked, hoping he'd say no and I wouldn't have to go back into that terrifying place. No, nope. I'll be out here waiting. As he said this, he seemed to root himself on the spot he was standing, like his trees, and remained unmoving. I took this as my sign to get the fuck back to my truck and get Jerry's fat ass out here. Not wanting to go through that horror show of a house, I took the long way around the side and back to the safety of my waiting truck. As I passed the side of the house, I saw something that caught my eye. A massive painting was hung on the wall, possibly being the only object not completely dilapidated, but still very creepy. The painting was of a massive tree, but it looked like all the branches ended with a human head with no eyes and dripping out blood. But the trunk of the tree decided it had to outdo the branches in the most fucked up contest ever. The trunk was shaped like a man whose legs were firmly rooted into the ground. His body straight as an arrow and his arms held high in the air, turning into the aforementioned branches. But the face of the trunk man took the cake for the macabre challenge. The mouth was locked in a permanent scream, spewing rivulets of blood that pulled up at the tree's roots. The eyes were wide open, seemingly fixated on the branches above as if in a trance with the gore-stained scene going on above its head. What the f... I mumbled to myself. Oh, if you were smart, Bobby, you'd leave. But alas, I'm a dumb, redneck grunt from Little Rock, and I refused to leave until the paperwork was signed. Well, I had bills to pay. So I decided to ignore the massive evidence that this place was probably not too safe, and continued onto my truck. As I approached my truck, I couldn't help but notice that it looked significantly lower. Now before you have to ask... Yes, my truck was lifted and I may or may not be compensating for something, oh, regardless of my inadequacies. As I got closer, I saw that my two front tires had gone flat. Well, I said aloud to myself, Look me sideways, how the f- I nearly yelled that last fuck, but I kept it down so I wouldn't have to deal with Vidha. I walked over to my now useless vehicle and inspected the tires, and when I realized what had happened, I silently cursed myself. Since I'd been so busy trying to avoid lugging equipment around, I hadn't noticed I'd parked directly on top of an upraised tree root. <sighs> now I had to not only make Jerry come here, but I'd need him to pick me up some spares. He was going to be pissed. I took one more look at the depressing sight that was my lifted 24-inch custom tires and opened the front cab. I started fumbling around with my little folder filled with different paperwork until I found the right documents. Thankfully, I had one copy left. First good news of the freaking day. The shitty part of the no-signal process is that you need the customer to verbally confirm with the manager that they want the site issue confirmed. Don't ask me why, probably some legal bullshit. Well, as I started making my way back to the yard, this time I took the site that didn't have the creepy-ass painting on it. So I arrived again to the backyard. I couldn't help but notice the absence of Mr. Vidha. Oh, shit, I muttered to myself. I headed towards where he was last standing. Well, maybe he was taking a leap behind one of his precious trees, and God knows there was no plumbing in that horror house. I made my way towards the end of the yard, carefully avoiding the little mounds, and started scanning the tree line. After about 30 seconds, I started to turn away and make the walk to the front door, hoping that he didn't want me to come inside. But as I was turning, I caught a glimpse of something black billowing about a hundred yards away in the woods. I moved in a bit closer and further away from the house and could sort of make out the object. 
thought it was Vidhair's jacket. As I took a closer look, I then saw a black boot only a few feet from where I was standing, and another roughly thirty yards past that. Oh, did this guy just strip down and wander into the woods? Well, this was it. The weirdest freaking day of my life. Now, you may be thinking, why didn't I book it and flag down the first car I saw and get the hell out of Dodge? Well, the answer is, I'm an idiot, and I'm curious by nature. Also, I couldn't just leave a job. It would apparently jeopardize the trust between my small company and the big ones we contract for. My next step would be to call Jerry and figure out what the hell I need to do. I pulled up my phone and hit Jerry's number. As I waited for the familiar gruff voice to ask, What the fuck do you want? The phone cut off. I looked down at my screen and saw the dreaded Call was lost tag pop in front of the screen. Oh, fuck me right in the goddamn ass. I tried again, and this time it wouldn't even ring once. I started wandering around the backyard, hoping there was a stronger signal somewhere, when I finally gave up. My efforts were fruitless. It dawned on me that Jerry was with one of our new guys today up near Mountain View, about a hundred miles east of where I was, and a good two-hour drive. But on top of that, the call service may have been even worse out there. Oh, shit. No other manager was in today. Even if I could get service, they wouldn't pick up. My only option was to call the dispatch office for the satellite company. The folks over there have about zero sympathy for us not completing a job that was given to us, but having someone at least be aware of my situation may stop me from being canned. I made my way to the front yard and thankfully found a single bar of service. Just in case, I tried Jerry again, but nada. I started scrolling through my contacts list and found the number I was looking for. Well, it started ringing, thank God for small miracles, and thankfully I heard a pleasant female voice. Thank you for calling Northern Star, the number one satellite TV provider in North America. How can I assist you today? Wow, all this time saying I got someone to call, I had no idea what to tell them exactly. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a contractor out at Little Rock, and I um, have a bit of an issue with my current appointment. I waited for a moment and I heard the lady sigh and say in an annoyed voice, Have you tried calling your manager? Oh, these freaking heartless bastards. I needed a small amount of assistance, but it was too much of a freaking problem to take a call. SOP dictates you speak to your manager before calling us. Well, I've heard that a hundred and fifty times. Well, I wanted to say, yeah, Bitch, he has no service. I better got this call going. Instead, I tried a more diplomatic approach. I apologize. I know this isn't standard, but I can't reach my boss. He's out of service. I waited, praying she'd have some sympathy in her heart. Okay, sir. I'll transfer you to our area dispatcher. Prepare to hold. And like that, I was sitting there in the middle of nowhere listening to the soft melodies of Loggins and Messina while I waited for the dispatcher. The music abruptly stopped, and I heard an equally pleasant, yet male voice on the other end. Hey, this is Jack. Heard you got a problem out there in Little Rock. Thank God this guy wasn't a dick. Uh, hey Jack, yeah, I've got some weird stuff going on out here, and I'm definitely nowhere near Little Rock. I'm in the Ozarks, deep down in some backwoods, stuck with an MIA customer. I blurted out. Oh, it's it, yeah, the job number. Here it is, 306742. I heard Jack typing away at his keyboard, and a few mouse clicks later he said, Okay, a uh, Mr. Vid here. Oh yeah, he's totally out of your work area. How'd you end up out there? Ah, uh, freaking call out, man, I said, realizing these phone calls may be monitored and I should ease up on the cussing. Okay, so you said he is uh, MIA, like he isn't at home? No, Jack, come on. I went to my truck to grab some stuff. I mean, <laughs> shit, well, stuff... I came back and this guy was just gone. Weirdest part, though, I saw a trail of his clothes leading out into the forest. Like, his clothes? Yeah, man, his clothes. Well, from what I could see, it was his jacket and both his boots. And even I was starting to think this was made up. There was no way this guy believed me. Well, <laughs> I'm looking through all my notes here, and there's not a single SOP explaining what to do if a customer wanders off into the woods. But I'm pulling up some satellite images of the area, and I do see a small pond formation about a half kilometer from his house. 
Maybe he went swimming. And as he said this, I could hear him stifling his laughter. Look, yeah, I know this sounds crazy, but there's this whole bunch of creepy-ass stuff going on around here. This guy's terrifying looking. The house is barren except for an almost 70-year-old zenith and a rusty-ass rocking chair, and not to mention this painting, I replied, hearing the frustration in my own voice. Painting? Jack asked, either moved by my tirade or trying to avoid a confrontation with a crazy person. Well, I couldn't tell, but he definitely sounded less light-hearted. After he asked this, I gave him a brief description of the picture I'd seen, what the guy looked like, and even the weird little mounds, and for a fleeting moment, he was silent. I don't know how to tell you this, but as long as he wasn't a danger to you or under the influence of alcohol, you're going to need the paperwork signed, Jack stated matter-of-factly. But to me, that would be absurd. This whole situation sounds crazier than a group of shithouse rats, and I think you should call it a day. I mean, I wouldn't want to be there, and I'm sure your company would let it slide if you said you felt uncomfortable. I like this guy. He didn't just state the guidelines and hang up. He reacted in a logical manner and said something a non-office drone would say. I thought I'd meet a company man who thinks like an actual person. Well, I'd say the solution would cover the rest of my problems, but I've got another issue. My two front tires are blown and I only got one spare, I said, hearing the defeat in my voice. Well, don't worry about it. I'll contact a local... T As Jack was about to offer me my salvation from this mess... I heard the high-pitched scream of a woman coming from out in the forest. Well, the last time I heard a scream like that, some civvy in Afghanistan had found her kid torn to shreds by an IED. Bobby, are you alright? What was that? I could hear Jack, but my senses were dialed up to ten and I could feel goose flesh forming on my skin. Bobby, did you hear me? What the fuck was that? Jack asked again, but this time I answered. Yes, yeah, some lady... Screaming bloody murder right in the goddamn direction that weirdo walked in, I whispered, trying to keep myself unnoticeable. Jack, my mind's telling me to run down this driveway and don't look back, but if I leave some woman out here to some horrible fate, I'll hate myself for it. Bobby, everything about this place sounds horrifying, but that had to be a neighbor or some... I cut Jack short this time. Man, you got the sad images... There ain't a single freaking person around except for crazy eyes out there. He had an upstairs. Could have been keeping a chick up there for all we know. And the minute I left, he grabbed her and took her to the woods to... I couldn't finish the sentence. I was already all nerves and thinking of someone getting killed or worse out there might have put me over the edge. Jack, by the time the cops get out here, if someone's getting hurt, I think I need to go out there. I couldn't hear Jack on the other end. He was contemplating what I'd just said. Well, if you're dead set on wandering off into the woods and confronting whatever's out there, go grab your Bluetooth and bring me along for the ride. I'll try to call the local PD on the other line, Jack said. Well, I honestly thought he would at least try to stop me. Okay, Jack, I will. Let me get some stuff from my truck, I responded, thankful I wouldn't be fully alone. I made my way again to my truck and reached under the seat to grab my piece. Well, call me a bandwagoner, but I do love me a Glock. I put the gun in the front seat and put my Bluetooth in my ear. Jack, you hear me? I asked. Well, those Bluetooth earpieces were finicky at best, and I didn't want to lose my only companion. Yeah, I got you. Are you sure you want to do this? Oh, now he's asking. Yeah, man, some poor lady might be getting hurt out there. Specific duty, I said, trying not to reveal how terrified I was. I grabbed a magazine from the toolbox and started pushing 40 caliber rounds into it. I slammed that bad boy in the pistol and pulled the slide back with an audible click. Do you have a gun? Jack asked hesitantly. You bet your sweet ass I do. I'm in Arkansas and we actually have the right to defend ourselves out here. Oh, I'm not judging, but just glad you have some protection. I mean, SOP dictates I have you fired, but the situation seems to call for a gun. Thanks, Jack. A hint of a smile formed on my face as a question came to my mind. Jack? Yeah? Are you in a cubicle right now? I asked, thinking of the irony of a guy wrapped up in his pre-death coffin listening to me embark on an adventure, or quite possibly my ultimate demise. 
that's really what you're going to ask me? Not like, hey Jack, can you call the cops? Or, hey Jack, can you convince me not to walk into the scary woods towards a screaming person? Or, why are you condoning this, Jack? He blurted out, sounding a little exasperated. Well, I can answer the last. I spent eight years in the army and my old lady wanted me to take a desk job when he had a kid. Now I'm stuck rotting away behind a desk, hoping for just a taste of something interesting. Well, I felt for the guy. I mean, I'd rather be in a temperature-controlled office building, not worrying about monsters or whatever the fuck was out there. But still, I'd probably rather die than have to make small talk with a bunch of office drones every day. So I guess I was on the fence about who had it worse. Oh, and no, I'm actually in management. Just took over for one of the guys who's sick. So I'm not in a cubicle, you prick. I'm in my own office. I have a window, Jack said triumphantly. I couldn't help but laugh a little. Not like this guy got screwed by a call-out, too. The walk from my truck to the edge of the forest was less than a football field, but every step felt like a mile. I could feel my heart beating in my throat, and my stomach was turning to knots. The perspiration on my forehead started to drip into my eyes as I made my way towards the tree line. I decided that maybe talking while I still could would alleviate some of the fear that was building up. I wiped the sweat away from my eyes as I said the first thing that came to my mind. So Jack, what you do in the army? I had a sigh on the other end of the line and then, after OCS, I went straight to job training in civil affairs, then Auburn, then Air Assault, and lastly Ranger School. After four years, I made captain, went to PSYOPs, and transferred over to 1st Special Forces Command. Another odd question to ask at a time like this, Bobby. Well, the first part sounded rehearsed. He'd probably got asked that a lot. Yeah, I'm just trying to build up courage here. Psyops, huh? Passing out flyers or doing shady shit? I asked, hoping I didn't sound too judgmental. Well, with none of the light-heartedness I'd heard him speak with before, he stated, Shady shit. All my experiences with anyone, even support personnel in special forces, was generally negative. They were always trying to be mysterious and act like whatever they did was secretive or clandestine. In reality, it was probably a 23-year-old NSA intern with a pimpled face and thick rimmed glasses that had more security clearance than these super soldiers. And I know PSYOPs guys probably really do some weird shit besides yelling at Taliban on a loudspeaker, so I'd give him the benefit of the doubt. Well, I definitely passed out my fair share of flyers on my first tour with PSYOPs. Jack continued with a hint of a laugh. You seem to know a thing or two about the military. You serve? Yeah, man. USMC 0311, I said with gusto. I heard another sigh, and Jack stated, Well, if you survive, I'll buy you dinner. Gallon of glue and a brand new box of Crayola sound good to you? I let out a laugh. Some of the fear assuaged and said lightheartedly, Ah, oh, fuck you. Not my best comeback, but i just reached the edge of the forest and the humor I'd felt moments ago had dissipated and was replaced by that stomach-knotting fear. All right, Jack, I just made it to the... And again, another ear-piercing scream came from farther into the woods. But unlike the last, this one didn't finish. It seemed to be cut off at the last second. It was go time, and I started running full tilt into the unknown. Bobby, quit running. Whatever's out there is going to hear you coming. Besides, whoever was screaming doesn't sound like they made it. Jack whispered into my ear. See, that's the difference between a guy like me and a guy like Jack. I think tactically and in the short term. Jack, obviously a strategy thinker, decided that there was no point risking me or our chance to stop whatever was out there for someone who was probably dead. Fuck it, though. Maybe this girl was hot, and if she wasn't too jacked up, I might get a blowy out of this. Yeah, don't hear you slowing down, Bobby. Yeah, that's because I'm a crayon-eating marine and I want to kick some... Another scream. Followed by... Help me. Please. Someone... The rest cut off by another scream from the speaker, followed by a vulgar tearing sound and a noise I can only describe as a bucket of chum being dumped out on a dry dock. The screams this time came from maybe 30 yards ahead of me, but the sounds had stopped completely, making everything eerily quiet. I heeded Jack's advice and slowed my sprint to a walk. I got down and started low-crawling to where I thought the screams had come from. 
As I inched closer, I could feel the roots and sticks making small cuts on my stomach. It was as if the whole forest floor had turned against me. But the pain subsided when I smelled something familiar. Rusted copper. Blood. I saw a large tree in my path and could make out a clearing beyond its massive base. I inched behind the tree and took a quick glance into the clearing. I felt bile reach the back of my throat. Vid Hare had his back to me as he was lifting up an axe and bringing it down on the body of a rather rotund and definitely dead woman. I guess you're never too fat to be kidnapped. <laughs> he kept bringing the axe down over and over again on this lady's already decimated corpse, blood misting and squirting out of her newly opened orifices. I also caught a glimpse of what had made the splattering chum noise. About three feet away from her body, it looked as if her stomach was torn out and all of her innards were spilled onto the ground. It was a squirmy mass of intestines, kidneys and other organs, all leaking blood and other fluids. The smell of blood, half-digested food and shit from her punctuated colon permeated the air. It was so strong I felt as if I could taste it. Jack, I whispered as quietly as I could into the Bluetooth. This guy disemboweled a chick and is chopping her to pieces. Jack didn't respond for what felt like ten years, until I heard a quiet munching. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. I got bored waiting and grabbed a snack. Snickers really do help hunger pangs, you know. Oh, fuck Jack. I'm out here watching some woman get butchered by a psychopath and you're eating a Snickers? I whispered, trying my hardest to keep Vidhair unaware of my presence. Sorry, Bobby. We weren't saying much and I needed a snack. You're still alive, so nothing too crazy happened. Jack stated, matter-of-factly. Avoiding the topic of the horror show in front of me, he continued. Also, I uh, think I'm onto something. I did some research while you were fucking around in the woods, and I think maybe I know what you're dealing with. But uh, you ain't gonna like it, brother. I was getting impatient and trying not to retaste my daily Egg McMuffin, so... I said as quietly as I could while expressing my annoyance. What? Just tell me. I doubt I can be more creeped out than I already am. Well, behind the tree, the mounds, and Mr. Tall, dark and terrifying. I think you're dealing with the evil Danish god of the forest, Jack said without a hint of humor. What the fuck are you talking about? I asked incredulously and possibly a bit too loudly because Vidhair suddenly stopped hacking. Oh shit, this is it. This is how I freaking die, I thought. But the footsteps and sudden death never came and the hacking resumed. Jack then spoke up. Well, that was close, so anyhow, I'll explain what I found. I went on to some sort of occult Google. I've never seen this search engine before. And basically, you type in a description of a monster or whatever shit you're dealing with, and it tells you what it is. I'm pretty positive from what you've told me that you're dealing with a Danish forest god, who happens to be an evil prick, like super evil. He requires pieces of a thousand corpses to build his army of humanoid tree monsters. So, for example, if you were to dig up those little mounds you saw, you'd be finding fingers, toes, ears, and other human parts used as a seeds to grow his forest friends. As Jack was speaking, I poked at a mound near my foot. As I did, the loose pile of dirt revealed a piece of a human ear, or tongue, or something. I don't freaking know, I'm not a doctor. Jack continued. Next up is what he looks like. See, his body isn't a tree per se, but it's a tree with a face, screaming his commands and looking to the heavens. Oh yeah, there's severed heads on the tips of his branches that spell blood to help his tree babies grow. Um, any of this sound familiar? Jack stated, sounding almost amused. Sick fuck, I thought. Aloud, I whispered. So Vidher is some sort of nut serial killer trying to complete his masterpiece of a god he worships. After asking, I took another peek around the tree and saw Vidher bend over and pick up the lady's head. He then walked over to the other side of the clearing and poured out a massive ladder while balancing the blood-soaked head under his arm. Every time I looked out from my little cover, it seemed as if there was more and more blood. I would say it was just from that chick's cut open body, but it seemed as if the whole clearing was covered in fresh, undisturbed pools of blood. 
and that's when I realised that I'd hidden behind the wrong fucking tree. I looked up and saw the backs of hundreds of severed heads. If I hadn't seen that painting, I would have thought they looked like coconuts, but I knew better. And as to solidify that what I was seeing was real, a huge glob of blood spewed out of one of the heads and landed in the clearing with an audible splat. So here I was in the middle of the Ozarks, leaning against some crazy effigy of a forgotten god with a psycho no more than 15 feet away from me lugging around a head. This is definitely within the top five of the worst positions I've ever been in. Jack then spoke up on the headset. Hey, so here's something else in case your day wasn't already ruined. Apparently, Burstuk, that's the god by the way, has a psychic that he grants immortality to for their service. The servant is described as being of great height, little girth, and eyes as black as coal. That describes Vidher, right? I swear Jack sounded almost excited about all of this. I took a quick glimpse into the clearing, and Vidher was failing at his balancing act and trying with great intensity to grasp both the ladder and the head. I took his moment of distraction and slowly made my way back towards where I'd come from and to get to a safer vantage point. Jack... I made it back about 20 yards. Can you do me a favor and call the cops? I don't think I can do much more for that lady. I whispered, still trying to keep quiet. Yeah, I'm just going to further ruin your day. I've tried about five times. Each time I try reaching the town you're in, the call goes dead. I tried calling the police out here in Manhattan to see if they could do anything. Well, they laughed and told me they can't do much for someone in the middle of the Ozarks. I think you may be on your own. Well, except for me, buddy. Hey, if it's uh, any consolation and you get killed by a crazy or devil worshipper or his pet tree god, well, I'll avenge you. Okay, Jack was either the calmest mother in the world, or he was truly enjoying all of this. So what the hell should I do, Jack? And why the fuck are you so calm? Jack took a deep breath and spoke calmly, almost coldly. Put two rounds in his chest and one in his head. I highly doubt this guy or his tree are actually anything supernatural. Just a nut job who is obsessed with Danish folklore. And to answer your question, I spent a large amount of my life fighting some of the most violent, despicable terrorists on the planet. Some lady getting her guts spilled out and a skinny weirdo serial killer cutting people's heads off isn't too far from the shit I've seen. Damn, this dude is hard, I thought. Probably the best dispatcher I could have had today. Aloud, I asked. Okay, but... What if they're... Well, they are, you know, supernatural. Once again, in that cold voice, Jack spoke up. As per the article on these guys, you'll need to set aflame the old god Burstuk, and the servant will again be mortal. So set Burstuk on fire before he comes alive, and then shoot Vidher. Easy peasy. Damn, I bet this gung or ass army man wouldn't be so tough if he were here facing this thing alone. When he sounds confident, I gotta have some faith. I thought. I closed my eyes and kept my back to my new cover. You're going to do this, kid. Just go up there, tell him to freeze, put a few rounds in him, and when the cops finally show up, just say he charged you. Oh yeah, I should mention this call isn't being monitored, and you probably shouldn't mention parts of this conversation happening, Jack said. Okay, I'm ready to put this asshole down and get the hell out of here, I said, hoping I sounded less terrified than I felt. You got this, buddy. Jack said, trying to motivate me. I started back towards the clearing with the nightmarish theme and a rotting pile of innards as quietly as I could. As I got closer, I could see Vidhair on his ladder, fumbling to place the head on top of a branch. If it wasn't so horrifying to look at, you'd think he was just an ordinary guy, putzing around in his backyard, not a sociopath burying and hanging parts of desecrated corpses. I gathered up what was of my shot nerves and bellowed, Hey, dick back. Vidhair turned his head toward me as I snuck up behind him. Get down off the ladder, slowly. Once you hit the ground, turn around and put your hands up. I felt and sounded like a testosterone-fueled cop. It was almost as cool as being a testosterone-fueled marine, but instead of listening to me, Vidhair hopped down off the ladder and turned to face me. With a devilish sneer, he said, is my TV ready, cable boy? He laughed at my perplexed look. What? You think I should fear you and your mortal weapons? 
As he was speaking, he started toward the axe that was resting between us. Lord Burstuk granted me the gift of an unending life as long as I facilitated his rebirth in our world and assisted him in becoming the ruler of the forests once more. He was no less than five feet from the axe when I yelled, I'm warning you, nutjob. Do not take one more step. I will fucking spray your goddamn tree puppet with your fucking brain matter. In my ear, Jack shouted, Nice line. Where'd you hear that, a movie? Ignoring the psycho in my ear canal and keeping focus on the psycho reaching for the axe in front of me, I took a few steps back so as to avoid any axe wings if Vidhair reached for it. You are a fool, boy. I've been rebuilding the Garden of Berstuk for over a century. Many mortals have tried to stop me, but their bodies and their glorious life's blood belong to my lord, and soon Berstuk's revival will be completed. But you, you will never bask in the glory of my lord, for I shall bring down his justice and let his children bathe in your blood. As he said this, he charged forward, reaching for the axe. I warned him not to move, but he made his choice. I felt the welcome feeling of the gun recoiling in my hand and the vibrations it sent up my arm. My aim was a bit off, but all three rounds found a home. The first two ripped into his stomach, filling the already stinking clearing with the smelling of rotting meat and fecal stew, and the third snapped his head back as it buried its way between those black-as-night eyes, fulfilling my promise of spraying his precious tree with his brain matter and skull fragments. Vidhair crumbled in a heap on the ground, adjacent to the leftover pieces of the girl he'd butchered earlier. I heard the crackling on the Bluetooth. Is he dead? Jack asked, again with that ice-cold voice he'd donned when he was talking about taking lives and stacking bodies. Well, I was pretty sure, but I started walking over to make certain I'd be facing manslaughter charges in my near future. I was a foot away when Vidhar's hand bolted out and grabbed my ankle. Pain shot up my leg. His grip was like a bear trap. I put two more rounds in his skull, which caused his head to once again violently flail backwards, smashing into the ground. But his fucking hand stood strong. I reached out and grabbed the axe and took a powerful downward swing, severing his bony appendage and releasing the pressure on my ankle. I don't know if it was the adrenaline or the fear, but one thing I finally noticed was that he wasn't bleeding. Five bullets in a detached hand, but barely any blood, just a small trickle from the axe wound. I swear I saw brain and skull fly out when I popped him in the head. Jack, he isn't freaking bleeding. I put five rounds in this asshole and chopped off his hand. Just a few drops, I said desperately, trying to express my confusion. From what I can read, the servant will drain all his blood to feed the early parts of Burstwick's development, Jack said, finally with a hint of worry in his voice. Bobby, I think this might be the real thing. As Jack spoke the last word, Vidhair's eyes turned towards me as the holes in his face healed themselves. He let out a guttural laugh and roared. I have already proclaimed. I have been given the gift of immortality by the great Lord Berstuk, and no corporeal weapons can scathe me. If you heard him, he stays down for a minute. Do something and get the fuck out of there, Jack yelled through the headset. And he was right. I picked up the axe before Vidhek could make a move and brought it down onto his skull, splitting it almost clean in half. And I saw what was left of his brain matter spill out onto the forest floor. Uh, there's no way he's getting up any time soon, I said into the mic. I cut the fucker's head clean in half. Still, instead of admiring your morbid handiwork, why don't you get the fuck out of there? Jack yelled into my ear. He was right. I started booking it through the woods, hopefully towards my truck and the large can of gasoline I keep in the bed. Even though I was at most 200 yards away from my truck, my swollen ankle kept me from getting there quickly. Vidhair was probably already healed up and fixing to feed me to his tree. Luckily I had Jack help keep my shit straight as I made my way back to my waiting Ram 1500. When I made it into the yard, I went around the side with the painting and made sure to give Burstuk the bird and said, I'm going to burn you down, motherfucker, and all your little tree babies. Oh, and your servant Vidhair. I'm going to gut him slow. Just you wait, bitch. Talking to a painting, Bobby? 
Jack chirped in my ear. You may need some therapy when this is all said and done. Way ahead of you. Apparently I have PTSD, I responded. Yeah, don't we all? Jack said with a bit of humor in his voice once again. While we were talking, I made it back to the ram and started sifting through all my junk looking for my gas can. Ah, found it, I said triumphantly. And my lucky ladder's in the dash. Jack, I may not die today. Oh, you should set your standards a bit higher. Let's hold off from celebrating until you ice the tree monster and his psychic. Hurt? Jack asked. Hurt, I responded. Slightly annoyed, he wouldn't let me have at least a second to chill. But then I grinned to myself as I pulled out the naked woman-shaped light I'd had since I was 18. It was the last birthday gift I'd gotten from my pops. Yeah, he was that kind of guy that brought his son a tick-covered lighter that had nipples that glowed in the dark. <laughs> I love my pops. Alright, Jack. I'm taking the long walk back. Hopefully I don't run into Vidhead. If you do, just put a few bullets in him and keep moving, Jack said, back with that frigid voice of his. I studied my way back towards that god-awful scene in the woods, doing my best to remain quiet and unseen. The pain in my ankle subsided, or my mind had given up on trying to tell me to lay off it for a while, so I was able to move a bit quicker. My ultimate goal was to get back there and find vid hair, still split open like a piñata. I made it to about ten feet out when I saw a familiar semi-nude man standing in the clearing, as if he was waiting for me. I guess no luck on him still spilling guts on the dirt. Jack, fuckface is standing again. I'm gonna pop a few more rounds in him, maybe hack off a foot. Don't waste any time, man. Who knows how close Burstuk is to coming back. Put a round in Vidher's skull and set that fucking tree on fire, Jack commanded. He was right. I charged forward, and before Vidhair could react, I placed another round between that little shit's eyes. He crumpled back to the ground, and just for shits and giggles, I grabbed the axe and swung it right back into his skull. I turned around to face the nightmare tree and tried to figure out how to go out burning down this monster. Bobby, from what I can tell, all you gotta do is set the trunk on fire. That should take care of it, Jack instructed from the headset. Also, it says something in the article you should probably hear. Do not speak to the old god because he can and will bend you to his purpose. So don't talk to the tree. Oh, great. I'm going to get Jedi mindfuck from a talking tree. Can't wait to tell my shrink. And that's when I first saw this thing's face. It was just like the painting, but more expressive, angrier. I started pouring the gas on the base of the tree trunk, which added another wonderful smell to this already shit and death filled clearing. As I poured the last of the gas onto Burstuk, he decided then he was going to speak up. Hello, Robert. His voice sounded like Barry White after a bout of laryngitis. Why do you attack me? Why have you hurt my faithful servant? We mean you no harm. All we want is to bless the world with my glory. I looked at the old god's face while he was talking, but not once did I see his mouth move. It was as if he was speaking into my mind. Don't talk to him, Bobby. Just light him up and go home, I thought. And then his voice spoke up again. Robert, you have accomplished nothing since leaving your warrior class. I can grant you immortality and a life of bliss. New woman every day. Your coffers filled with limitless gold and power over all other men. Take my root and drink deeply from my life's blood, and your every desire will be fulfilled. As he said this, a spigot formed on his trunk directly in front of my face. Jack, the tree's talking, I mumbled. Don't listen, Bobby, Jack yelled from the headset. He's just distracting you. He doesn't need two slaves. Think about it. As Jack was yelling, I felt myself drawn to the spigot-shaped root protruding from Bastook's body. Fight it, Bobby. Don't be a goddamn window licker. For some reason, being accused of licking windows pulled me back to reality, and it was almost too late. Midhair was sneaking up behind me with the same axe I'd spilt his skull with twice. At the last second, I dodged his swing by jumping backwards into Burstuk because I felt the axe swipe past my face. As I dodged the attack, I dropped my lighter into a tangle of Burstuk's roots. I was able to lift up my forty and pull the trigger four times, but only three rounds came out of the barrel. 
The last got jammed in the chamber. I watched as one of the bullets struck right where his heart should be, but this time Vidhair didn't even go down. He stumbled slightly and moved closer, laughing maniacally the whole time. Fool, Pestuk is close to being completed, and his power has fueled me to unprecedented strengths. Now be still and I will end this quick, Vidhair proclaimed. Okay, then do me a favor and answer two questions. I won't fight anymore, I said in my most defeated voice. Vidhe seemed to ignore my request until... Let him speak, my faithful servant, Bastuk boomed. His weapon has ceased to be useful and can do us no harm. His begging for life will amuse me. I heard in my ear. What are you doing? Run, he can't be that fast, Jack begged. Ignoring Jack, I got onto my knees and discreetly grabbed my lighter while feigning injury. Dying on your knees, how pathetic, Vidhair mocked. Ask your questions and be done with it. I looked Vidhair in his dead eyes and asked, Why would you ever let me distract you? As I asked Vidhair this question, I hit the starter on my pop's old lighter and dove forward as I felt my ass being scorched from the burning gasoline flames. An unholy scream erupted in my head, causing my ears to ache and my head to spin. I will tear you limb from limb. I will come back and take your head as my first tro- Burstook couldn't finish his sentence because the flames had reached his face. I saw as the bark that was his flesh charred and burned the hole while he was screaming in my head. I was able to shake off the shock and turn my attention back to Vidhair. Hopefully he was no longer immortal. He just stood there, staring at his master with tears welling up in his eyes. Why have you done this? You could have been a part of the great Lord Bestuk, but you have slain him, Vidhair cried. My last act as his servant will be to avenge him and take the life of... Before I let this asshole finish his sentence, I unjammed my Glock and shot him in the stomach, just so I get the chance to watch him die slowly. I looked down at Vidhair, and it seemed the spell, or whatever it was, had begun to wear off, because he looked like he was in pain. His intestines were spilling out of the gaping wound in his gut, and I finally saw the right amount of blood starting to pool in the dirt. In a weak voice, he said, My whole life, in servitude to my lord, ended by a low man, a servant. As he spoke, I saw blood trickle out of the side of his mouth. I guess a bullet fragment ended up in his lungs. What I felt now was the right time to ask my last question. Oh yeah, before I forget, before you die, why the fuck did you order satellite TV? I asked, hoping that I'd finally find out why I was out here in the first place. Vidhe smiled a bloody smile, looked me in the eyes and said softly, I... I missed the view. That Raven Simone is a hoot. Well, I thought my opinion of this pathetic shit couldn't get any lower. When he said the view was the reason my ass was out here, I emptied the rest of my magazine into his skull, spraying his fucking brains for the last time onto the forest floor. Jack, it's over. The tree's burning up and Vidar empties insides onto the ground. Oh, if it wasn't for you, buddy, I'd never have made it. I owe you a drink, brother, I said into the mic. So, an ancient deity and his undying sycophant killed by an out-of-shape former marine turned cable technician. Who the hell would have thought, Jack says. I'm glad you're okay, buddy, but looks like the local PD finally noticed. They gave me a holler on the other line, and that friggin' chief of police gave me a serious tongue lashing, yelling about the crazy nut blasting off rounds in the woods. Fuck. I'm about 85% positive I just saved the world and I'm probably going to be arrested for murder, I complained. Well, if it makes you feel better, I'll probably get popped for helping your ass out. So, want to be prison roomies? Jack asked, with a hint of humor. I grunted in response as I heard the distant sirens. Ah, oh, well, at least I won't have to install cable anymore. And 
so once again, we reach the end of tonight's podcast. My thanks, as always, to the authors of those wonderful stories, and to you for taking the time to listen. Now, I'd ask one small favour of you. Wherever you get your podcast from, please write a few nice words and leave a five-star review, as it really helps the podcast. That's it for this week, but I'll be back again same time, same place, and I do so hope you'll join me once more. Until next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye.